Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, which is part of a new project on pops in plastics and on monitoring pops in, in plastics. It is a great pleasure to see you all here. My name is Martin Scheringer, and I'm the chair of the uh, IPCP, the International Panel on Chemical Pollution. And together with Roland Weber, uh, I will just say a few words now at the beginning of this webinar today. The, the new project on POPs in plastics is part of a jeff funded project on continuing support, original support for the POPs Global Monitoring Plan under the Stockholm Convention. And Roland Weber has the lead of that project, and we thank Roland um, very much for taking on all that work. And the IPCP supports Roland with the administration and implementation of the project. And uh, one important activity in the new project, the project is ongoing now and will, um, I think, last just a couple of weeks or months into the summer, uh, into June. So an important activity in the project is a series of webinars, as they are shown here uh, on that slide now. And there are three parts. And today and tomorrow is the first part, which will deliver or cover a lot of background on POPs in plastics. And then the second and third part will take place in May. And they will then be more specific on first the sampling of plastics uh, for POPs to, to be able to just um, prepare the samples to determine POPs in plastics. And then in the third part, the specific um, techniques needed to extract, clean up, and analyze um, the, the samples for POPs analysis or POPs determination. And with this, I think I can hand over to Roland, he will, who will say a few more words about the webinar today. Thank you. Yes, um, the first maybe an addition, thank you, Martin, um, is that uh, our uh, second and third part, so that will be in the second half of May, um, we have not decided yet the days, but we will uh, do that uh, soon and also then uh, will inform you in the same way as we did here with the first webinar. Um, today, our uh, program is uh, quite uh, uh, packed. So therefore, yes, um, we can um, start uh, with it. And the first uh, input would come from uh, Sandra Averu Monere. Uh, she, so she is a uh, project manager in, uh, in, in, in UNEP uh, Chemicals and Health Brands in Geneva. And um, she is responsible there for different kind of uh, chemical works uh, related uh, also to uh, plastic, but also to mercury. And uh, therefore, I would like to hand over to Sandra. Thank you very much, Roland, and uh, and thank you, Martin, for the the introduction and the presentation of the webinar. I, I wanted to take the opportunity to welcome all attendees and and wish good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to uh, to all, and uh, and to highlight how um, the organization of this webinar actually has all the ingredients uh, to. Uh, be of extreme relevance uh, these days, and so. I will just highlight a few. Um, the first one um, being, of course, the science and, and the uh, in-depth work that IPCP is putting and all the members of IPCP, uh, the NGOs, uh, the um, different professors that are here and will be presenting today are putting into science and in the, the knowledge sharing. Um, the, the second, of course, is the um, the, the title, the pops in plastics, uh, which touch um, very closely to the work that UNEP uh, has been conducting uh, in close cooperation with uh, with IPCP among others and and with uh, mm -hmm. Roland. Um, and I'll highlight two elements. The first one, um, the pops uh, global monitoring program funded by the GEF, um, that is a, a large program that has been um, contributing to um, 
having global med monitoring plan projects, collecting over 900 samples of air, water, human milk, and other matrices such as diary, egg of fish, and sediments in 42 countries in Africa, Asia Pacific, and Latin American and Caribbean regions for the analysis of POPs listed under the Stockholm Convention. And this has taken place since um, 2016. A number of POPs were found in many samples, um, including PFOS, uh, and they are sometimes at elevated levels in water and human milk in remote area, including in the Pacific Islands, for example. Um, I won't go into details, but um, chlor chlorinated paraffins, including the short chain chlorinated paraffins, um, or the medium chain ch chlorinated paraffin, were also found. Um, and they are the second highest concentration of POPs in human milk on global average after DDT. Um, and flame retardants, PBDs, HBCDs were also detected in various samples. Um, we thought as UNEP it would be really interesting to make sure that uh, we are able to link this project, this program actually funded by the GEF and the current work uh, undertaken in the context of plastics. Um, so as, as a large share of industrial pops do present uh, additives in plastics or polymers, for example, um, we thought monitoring of POPs in plastics could be also um, uh, an important element to share today and a very big environmental challenge. We are working um, as UNEP and with Holland being actually the lead author of a report on chemicals in plastics, um, a technical report from UNEP that will be released very shortly ahead of um, the uh, INC2, the, the committee that is negotiating um, currently an internationally legally binding um, instrument on plastics pollution. And so I wanted to link to this element as well and, and show that um, the topic of today and the information and level of details that this webinar will take the time to go into during today's um, will be extremely useful as well uh, to characterize and to support the ongoing um, exchanges and discussions uh, that are led by member states. So as you know, the, the resolution, or you may know, the resolution um, on, uh, on ending plastic pollution uh, was uh, agreed upon by member states at UNEA the United Nations Environment Assembly in March uh, 2022. And it is setting up the path uh, to a global treaty to end plastic pollution. So the second session of the uh, negotiating committee will take place in Paris from 29 of May to 2nd of June, 2023. And um, the INC, the INC Secretariat is preparing also a series of webinars ahead of um, this uh, committee. One webinar will be on science and, and we will be presenting the findings and the report on chemicals in plastics there. So it's on the 4th of May at 3 p.m. Um, Geneva time and so Central European time. And we really look forward to uh, further sharing the highlights of this present of this report with you. Um, in the meantime, thanks a lot for the organization of this event and the webinar. Um, as mentioned in my introduction, uh, it has all the ingredients. It's uh, it's everything we need. Um, so with the science and to the policy interface. So hopefully we will be uh, bringing and sharing um, very useful knowledge during these two days. So thank you again for the organization and for uh, your attendance all today. And we really look forward to the fruitful exchanges and information. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Uh, also, thank you very much the last uh, three years for the good cooperation on the chemicals in, in plastic uh, uh, report. Um, and that it's uh, a hot topic uh, we see also in the interest of attendees. Yeah, I think we have more than 250 uh, registered um, people. Um, the next presentation would be given from uh, Professor Martin Scheringer. Yeah, Martin uh, would introduce the work of IPCP. And therefore, Martin, you can share your screen. Thank you, Roland. And thank you, Sandra. Um, and I just do what you said and share my screen. Um, I guess you can see now my slides. So I will just say a few words about the IPCP, the International Panel on Chemical Pollution, and its work in support uh, of the science policy interface. And just one word about the IPCP. It is a network, a global network of academic scientists working on chemical pollution issues from all areas of science. And if you're interested, you find more about the IPCP, the bylaws, the goals uh, at ipcp.ch. The main mandate or mission of the IPCP really is science policy work or to support science policy work uh, at several points in several areas. Of course, science policy work is very broad and includes many, many activities all over the world. It's just a few areas where the IPCP has been able to, to make a contribution. And I will just highlight these ones now here in this presentation. The first one, which is also very important right now, a lot of things are going on right now, is the Science Policy Panel on Chemicals, Waste and Prevention of Pollution. And the IPCP has been interested in this topic for many years. Here is an extensive, let's say, background report, a mapping and gap analysis of existing uh, science policy interface bodies or organizations in international chemicals governance. And this report was published in 2019. It is available from Zenodo here at this link provided. And it is an extensive report of more than 100 pages where you find a lot of details and background information. Then we at the IPCP were able to highlight the, the need for a global science policy body on chemicals and waste and why we should have that and why it is um, use, would be useful um, to have it and how it could look. We were able to highlight this in a paper in the journal Science that came out in early 2021. 20, uh, and <clears throat> then we were also have been, have been involved in the ongoing um, actual intergovernmental work. There is now the Open Ended Working Group that, um, sets, that, that um, implements um, or has been tasked to come up with a uh, setup for this new panel by UNIA. And there are the open ended working group meetings. There was the meeting in Bangkok in January, February this year. And we of IPCP were also there. We published a series of what we call Bangkok briefings that you find at our website, ipcp.ch. Then Another important area, and Sandra mentioned this, uh, is of course the Plastics Treaty with the new, the next meeting of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee in Paris. And Roland, as a lead author, has worked with many of us, with many colleagues and friends, IPCP members and others, on an extensive report on chemicals and plastics, which will be published just um, before the INC meeting starts. And this contains a wealth of technical information uh, on chemicals and plastics, covering for these four main areas. First, an overview of chemicals and plastics and in various use sectors of plastics, because this is a very broad and diverse and heterogeneous uh, area, because we know that plastics are used in so many ways and so many different plastics are used in so many different ways and applications. Then the second area is exposure to chemicals in plastics, exposure of environmental systems, environmental organisms, and also humans. Then the third is the question of substituting chemicals in plastics and also plastics themselves wherever possible with more sustainable alternatives. 
And the fourth area is then the question of plastic waste in a circular economy because that will be a huge task and challenge to try to establish a more circular economy using plastic in, in, in better and different ways than it is today. And chemicals in plastic are a key factor that may or may not um, make the plastic suitable for recycling and further use. An earlier activity that is also related to chemicals and plastics um, by IPCP was extensive an extensive um, compilation of information on endocrine disrupting chemicals and where they have been used. And um, their IPC, the IPCP team prepared three overview reports that came out in 2017. And this is just um, the information on the first of them, which is uh, on the initiatives um, also legal initiatives to identify endocrine disrupting chemicals. And you can find all of three of these reports on the UNEP uh, website. Now, uh, at the end, uh, just a few words about the new, the current project on pops and plastics and the, G the GMP, the Global Monitoring Plan. As we said, there are three main activities in this project. And again, Roland has the lead of all this, and this will be a lot of activity and work in the next couple of weeks. The first activity is this series of webinars from now and tomorrow to then part two and three later in May. The second activity is an assessment of the state of knowledge and of gaps in sampling analysis and analysis of POPs and POP candidates in plastic pellets in major use sectors. So that will be in a report that addresses and summarizes all of these findings. And activity three is actual monitoring, actual measuring POPs in plastics in different UN regions. And samples will be collected in different countries in Africa, Asia, in the, in the Gulag region. And then the, the POPs in these samples will be analyzed in collaborating laboratories in Japan. Germany and Thailand. So that's what I have as an overview of IPCP work in support of the science policy interface. And again, I thank Roland for his work with this project. I send, thank Sandra and UNEP for the support of all of this work. And I wish you all a productive and informative webinar today. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Martin. Uh, the sampling is uh, currently ongoing. Yeah, it has started in 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 March, uh, and uh, yeah, so it is sampling in uh, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, in Africa, Nigeria, um, Ghana, and in Asia, um, Mongolia, Thailand, um, Vietnam, Indonesia, and uh, I'm happy today. The samples uh, from Nigeria reached the Japanese uh, laboratory, so we are also already analyzing uh, in this uh, in this project. But it has a very tight timeline, timeline, so somehow we need to finish the analysis uh, in May um, and the report by mid of of June. Um, so <laughs> we are quite uh, quite busy. Um, good. Uh, coming to the Next presentation, uh, we thought uh, that it's interesting uh, to give a short introduction uh, to uh, uh, polymers and um, plastics, additives and other plastic related chemicals. So that's a bit uh, a dry presentation, but I think it's good uh, to be on the on the same page. Um, so this presentation is together uh, with uh, Dr. Tsen Yun Wang. Uh, unfortunately, he could not uh, join today. He is busy otherwise, so therefore so I have to present that. But most of the slides are from uh, Dr. Wang. Next slide. So the content of the presentation is first, what, what are plastics? Then uh, different grouping of plastics. Um, plastics and their major applications, and then uh, different type of plastic additives and uh, their function. So first, yes, what are plastics? Um, plastics come from the Greek word plastikos, 
uh, and this means uh, capable of being shaped or molded. Difference between uh, plastics and polymers is that the polymer is just a substance or material consisting of very large molecules, which are called uh, macromolecules, and they are composed of many repeating subunits. Yeah, one example is uh, as a monomer, the, the vinyl chloride, and then there is a polymerization to the polyvinyl chloride, and uh, then this uh, polyvinyl chloride is then the polymer. The same for polyethylene. This means taking ethylene, polymerizing it, and then uh, you get uh, polyethylene. But this is not a plastic yet. So uh, this is uh, now just uh, this macromolecule. Wait a moment, which you see here. Yeah. So these are the macromolecules. So that it is a plastic, it needs um, something else. So first, uh, plastics are all organic polymers, and they use additives. Yeah. For example, like a plasticizer. So for uh, PVC, if you only have a PVC as a polymer, it is just a, a powder and a, a rigid uh, material. So uh, we need additives like uh, plasticizers, um, finally, to make uh, a plastic out of it. All plastics are therefore polymers, but not all polymers are plastics. Yeah, So it needs the additives that the polymer uh, becomes a plastic. So there are different terminologies uh, for, for plastics. One is that they are named uh, on the polymer ma matrix. So one option uh, everybody probably knows are uh, they are named after their polymers. So polyethylene, PE, or polystyrene, PS, or polyvinyl chloride, what I just uh, introduced. Or plastic can be named after characteristic groups in their repeating units. So, for example, uh, polyamides, which have uh, here the amide group. This is, for example, nylon. Or <clears throat> polyester, you know, from the textiles, 60% of all textiles are made uh, from, from po uh, polyesters, especially um, here. PES is the ester group. Or polyurethane. Uh, where uh, you might uh, sit on it, on your chair or on your sofa, here with the amide uh, and the polyurethane uh, group. Or a third one is uh, our, uh, the name after UPAC. Um, so they name it after their full uh, chemical structure. Here one example as a polyoxymethylene. So therefore, one plastic may have uh, many names. So here, this is uh, terephthalate. This is uh, glycol, ethylene glycol. And uh, if you put it together, it's polyethylene glycol, terephthalate, or PET. Or in recycling, normally, you uh, name it uh, PET. But also, you can make, name this polymer as um, a polyester, because here you have the, the, the ester group. And uh, you might know this as a textile, as a polyester. But as a bottle, as a plastic bottle, you might uh, know it as PET. Yeah? But basically, the chemistry and the polymer is the same. The difference is then. Uh, what kind of additives you have to make a plastic bottle or what kind of additives you make to make a textile out of it. Also, UPEC name uh, here, the full chemical structure. So you see quite long. I will not uh, really uh, repeat that. Uh, and you also understand why normally uh, not the UPAC name uh, is used uh, in, in public um, to name different plastics. And then we have a different grouping of plastics. So the first grouping um, 
which is then is according to their hardening process. So there are thermoplastics. So they harden through simple cooling of a polymer melt and um, soften while being heated. Yeah, this mean, this is really uh, uh, plastic. So you can mold uh, these type of plastics. You see here the uh, 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 polymer chains yeah, are uh, in a way together that they can be uh, uh, reshaped uh, when it's heating. And as a second uh, type uh, of grouping, you have the thermosets. So here, uh, these uh, plastics, they harden through chemical cross-linking reaction between the different polymer molecules. Yeah. So you see here the, the chains, but these chains are kind of uh, linked together. And uh, therefore, when they are heated, they do not soften, but they are decomposing at higher temperature. So therefore, for these uh, thermosets and the thermoplastics, a uh, big difference is that uh, here you cannot uh, recycle them just by, by heating them and, and reshaping them. While the thermoplastics, polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, PVC, PET, for example, they can be uh, melted and remelted and uh, recycled uh, in, in this way. Yeah. While on the other hand, uh, thermosets like polyurethane or the epoxy resins or melamine resins, uh, they are thermosets. They cannot be recycled just by heating. Then another grouping uh, of um, plastics is according to their cost and performance. So we have uh, here the commodity plastics uh, or standard bulk plastics, which have uh, very high production, but at relatively low costs. So this includes high density polyethylene or low density polyethylene, uh, polypropylene, also PVC, polystyrene, um, uh, expanded uh, polystyrene, and uh, also PET is a commodity plastic. Then. We have uh, engineering or technical plastics. So these are the plastics with improved mechanical properties and dimensional stability compared to commodity plastics. So uh, just a few examples, high impact polystyrene. So that's also a polystyrene, but uh, yes, with a different polymerization, the uh, polyamides or polycarbonate. Um, as a third group, we have the so-called high performance or specialty plastics, which are engineering plastics with even more improved mechanical properties. So this include, for example, liquid crystal polymers, um, fluoropolymers like PTFE, or polyether, ether ketone, uh, or so-called PEAK. And when you look here to this uh, pyramid, of um, different grouping here in respect to cost and performance. Um, you see, yes, the, the large amount here um, are uh, those commodity plastics. And when you go up the chain, they become more uh, specific and have here, for example, at the top of the pyramid, very um, good physical properties uh, in respect to, to temperature performance or uh, in respect to uh, chemical resistance or uh, strength and uh, stiffness. Then we can group plastics also according to their feedstock and uh, biodegradability. So according to feedstock, we can uh, distinguish between fossil-based plastics and uh, bio-based plastics and we can distinguish biodegradable plastics and non-biodegradable plastics. And what you see here, we have both. So we have uh, here bio-based, biodegradable plastics, but there are also uh, bio-based, non-biodegradable plastics. And the same for the fossil-based plastic. Um, we have um, biodegradable um, and fossil-based plastic like um, polybutylene uh, adipate terephthalate, 
And then we have the conventional plastics, which are non-biodegradable and normally made from fossil fuel, like polyethylene, polypropylene, and PET. But also when you look to the non-biodegradable and bio-based, you can also produce, for example, PET based on uh, bio-based uh, materials. Yeah. So this uh, you need uh, to, 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 to distinguish. And uh, there is also a big discussion about uh, biodegradability under which circumstances. So some of the biodegradable plastic, they only degrade relatively fast uh, under, let's say, industrial composting uh, condition, while they are not biodegrading or, let's say, uh, slowly bi biodegrading uh, in, in, for example, in the marine setting. Yeah, but uh, I will not go into uh, that detail. So. Also, a different grouping of plastics uh, is according to size. So here we have uh, macro, micro, and nanoplastics. But up to now, there is no commonly agreed uh, definition of micro and, and nanoplastics. Yeah, so often nanoplastics is considered uh, less than 0 0.1 micrometer, and uh, microplastic is uh, often defined uh, between 0 0.1 microgram to 5 millimeter. But for example, here in this definition, uh, it is defined microplastics from 0 0.1 microgram to one millimeter, and then from one millimeter to five millimeter, it can be called mesoplastics, and then above five millimeter, normally it's called macroplastics. Yeah, but uh, not yet uh, defined, uh, ISO defined uh, definition. Then we can uh, group them according to the use pattern. So we have uh, single-use plastics and uh, non-single-use uh, uh, plastics, where at the moment, yes, uh, we want to move from more single-use plastic to non-single-use plastics that becomes more uh, sustainable. And uh, the last is uh, the last grouping of plastics is according uh, to composition. So here we have uh, single layer plastics versus uh, multi-layer or composite plastics. So um, especially in the, in, in the food packaging often, the plastics uh, can have uh, different layers up to up to 10 layers of different uh, uh, type of plastics. So you do not see it from outside, but uh, quite uh, complex uh, these composite uh, uh, plastics with challenges uh, in, 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 in recycling. Uh, but also there, uh, companies are working uh, to separate the different layers and try to recycle even uh, this multi-layer plastics. But it's uh, quite a challenge. Um, so yes, um, major plastics. In a moment, I need to click here. Then I can yes, and they are application. So. Uh, co the commodity plastics like uh, the polyethylene, polypropylene. So they make uh, about in total 85 to 90 percent of the sum of demand of plastics, while the engineering and other plastics are only about uh, 10 percent of the plastic. So uh, here you see um, the different uh, type of plastics, uh, how production have been increasing since the 1950s uh, to 2000. Uh, 15 uh, from Geyer et al. 2017. And you see here, uh, for example, the main commodity plastics, uh, low density polyethylene, high density polyethylene, and uh, polypropylene uh, together. Uh, that's nearly uh, yeah, a little bit less than, uh, than 50% yeah, of uh, total uh, plastic produced. Then when we look to major plastics and their application. Yeah, we see here the major applications of plastics. This is uh, packaging, which uh, for European Union is around 40%. And uh, when you look uh, global, it's about 36%. Uh, also, another uh, major use is uh, building and construction materials here, with close to 20% in the European Union, globally 16%. And uh, here you see the different um, plastic um uh, types and for example for packaging you mainly have the the, the, the poly different polyethylene high density uh, low density uh, we have uh, the, the polypropylene 
and here also a large use of PET, yeah, which are used then here in packaging. Yeah, when we go, for example, to building, it is uh, quite different. We see here for building and construction, the major use plastic is here uh, a PVC, yeah, and uh, also uh, polystyrene, yeah, especially here for 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 insulation. Uh, you also have a, quite a bit of of polyurethane, yeah, and also um, polyethylene and polypropylene. Yeah, when we look to automotive, uh, which is about uh, 10% in the European Union, 6.6% uh, um, of plastic share uh, from global perspective, but increasing. Yeah, you see uh, major use is here uh, polypropylene, quite stable. Um, also, you have the upholstery, polyurethane, and um, the others are, let's say, uh, smaller, smaller uses. What uh, all of you might know, this international racing identification coding system and uh, recyclability. So uh, the ASTM, International Racing Identification Coding System, is a set of symbols appearing on plastic products that identify the six major uh, plastic racings, the, the, these bulk plastics, out of which the production is made. And then um, here, like uh, P PET, high density polyethylene, PVC, low density polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, and uh, the seventh category are all other plastics uh, together. And uh, the aim of that labeling uh, was uh, for recycling. Uh, also here, the number uh, for the different polymer, they indicate uh, general ease of recycling. Uh, including also cost effectiveness of recycling, especially, you know, separation and transport, which is quite challenging when you have only a few amount of the plastic. So here, when you look to PET and high density polyethylene, so these are bulk plastics, uh, which uh, can also be nicely recycled. So they are normally gathered, um, separated, and then uh, brought back, while most of the other plastics have quite challenges uh, globally uh, in recycling. So overall in recycling, we have still less than 10% uh, of all plastics uh, uh, recycled. Um, and um, But for um, PET and high-density polyethylene, um, this share is higher. And we hope, of course, that also for the others, when we improve our waste management and separation, um, that we also will reach higher. Uh, recycling quota. Now we come to plastics and uh, additives. So on average, we have about 4% of the weight of plastics in average, uh, which are consisting of additives. Yeah, so that's, uh, you see the same figure, which I showed from Gaia et al. And uh, here you see the 4% uh, of weight of plastics, which are consisting out of additive. Um, but the exact level of additive can vary considerably. So, for example, uh, for PVC, the plasticizer can be up to 70% of the weight uh, for soft or very soft uh, uh, PVC. But in average, from all plastics, uh, when you compare the total pro polymer production and the total additive production, you see that's about 4% uh, in, in average. Um, yes, so why are these plastic additives needed? Chemical additives are substances added during the manufacturing processes of plastics to enhance the plastic performance. Yeah? The functionality, the resistance against aging or aesthetic uh, properties. And there are two major roles of uh, plastic additives. The first uh, role is stabilization. This means to retain the original molecular structure and performance of the polymer under the effect of heat and light and so on. Whoops. The second uh, role of plastic additives is uh, functionalization. This means to provide additional functions and attributes to the polymer matrix. Yeah, for example, here, uh, polymer pro uh, properties retention or uh, polymer properties extension mean, for example, adding UV adsorber, making uh, the polymer more resistance to the to sunlight, for example, 
or adding anti-fogging additives or optical uh, brightness. And then there are uh, customer uh, product properties protection. For example, uh, if uh, a company want that their plastic is anti-statics or uh, have uh, different uh, colors or have uh, some antimicrobial uh, properties. And uh, I will uh, quickly go through uh, the different main types of plastic additives. So first to look to the surface pro uh, property modifiers. So here we have uh, this anti-blogging uh, agents. This mean prevent films or sheets from sticking together. Anti-fogging agents prevent moisture from obscuring um, and film clarity. The anti-static agents preventing static uh, charge buildup. Uh, coupling agents improve the bonding to fillers or reinforcing fillers or release agents, which prevent uh, sticking. Then uh, we have chemical property modifiers uh, that uh, includes antioxidants. This means this prevent oxidative degradation of the polymer matrix uh, or uh, reduce at least oxidative degradation. We have biocides to prevent a microbial attack and mild dew. Then we have the flame retardants um, to reduce uh, flammability of uh, certain plastics, especially when they are used, for example, uh, in electronics uh, close to the electric source where the electronic equipment can get hot or ultra ultraviolet stabilizers, which prevent degradation uh, from sunlight. Important, for example, if it's in building outdoor. Then we have uh, Processing modifiers, yeah, including uh, blowing agents or cross-linking agents, heat stabilizers, uh, plasticizers, uh, also plasticizers here to reduce the melt viscosity in the production. Um, then uh, processing aid to increase, for example, the melt strength of a polymer or uh, lubricants here to promote the flow under external forces and the me mechanical uh, stability and the shearing and thermal uh, susceptibility when you are molding uh, plastics. Then um, mechanical property modifiers, this include uh, fillers. Fillers increase here the, the strengths of the polymers and they are mainly used uh, to reduce costs. So these are normally cheap and, and inorganic materials, um, which can then uh, reduce uh, the, the plastic cost finally. Then impact modifiers to improve the impact strengths, nucleating agents to improve light transmission and promote uh, crystallinity, and uh, reinforcing fibers to increase uh, strength and stiffness. We have then also plastic additives for uh, aesthetic uh, property modification. These are, uh, yes, color coloring agents, yeah, which make uh, this plastic so colorful. Uh, starting from toothbrush and ending at the uh, plastic toys. Um, then uh, also sometimes odorants are used um, here to add fragments to some um, of, of the plastic. This were the uh, different uh, type of plastic additives, an overview. And uh, when you look to the life cycle, uh, of, of additives, so they are added in every step of the production, depending on uh, what kind of uh, property here in the production of um, the, the polymer first. Yeah, this means monomer synthesis to the polymer uh, manufacturing, then uh, in the production of uh, the master batch. For example, here you use stabilizers or antioxidants, uh, processing aids and antistatics. Then uh, for the molding process, uh, when you produce then the different plastic pieces, uh, like uh, a CRT casing, there you are then bringing lubricants or colorants. And then uh, finally, uh, also for packaging uh, and uh, device components, uh, there are sometimes, uh, depending on what you are packing, uh, different uh, chemicals uh, added. One problem is here, you see, I mean, that it's quite complex uh, with, the, with the additives. And um, also in our report, I mean, we have looked to this uh, complexity 
of uh, additives and, and, and chemicals in plastics. Uh, and uh, one uh, uh, challenge which I would like to highlight also um, to industrial participants or to governments um, is that there is limited communication between the supply chain actors of the different additives. And therefore, at the end, uh, it is quite uh, complicated to understand what kind of additives are in many of these plastic products. Yeah? So finally, it's on us, often the analytical chemist, I'm, I'm chemist uh, also, analytical chemist for some time. Uh, so we have to look uh, to the nitty gritty um, of the, 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 the chemicals uh, in these different plastics and here the communication between the supply chain actors and the improvement would be very important. Um, to shed more light uh, into the use of plastic additives here, uh, the European Chemical Agency had a, had a project uh, to uh, assess what kind of chemical additives are uh, used in the, in the European uh, Union. So here they categorized here to nine major type of functional additives and uh, uh, pigments um, in this categorization. So there it was highlighted that plastics frequently contain six additives and more. Yes, some of them are hazardous. We will come in the second presentation to that. Um, and uh, finally, they found out that in the European Union, 418 high volume plastic additives are used above uh, 100 uh, tons per year. So uh, this the European Chemical Agency have uh, done uh, in the last years. I can recommend you to look to, to their work, what they have done, uh, because uh, now they are taking also regulatory action um, to, <laughs> let's say, yes, support uh, a more circular economy of plastic. Yeah, and one part of this is really to understand what is in plastic, yeah, to take out uh, some of the hazardous chemicals uh, as much as possible out of uh, production that finally we can come to clean cycles of, uh, of, of plastics that we can then recycle them back to new products. And in this frame, yes, also uh, UNEP, uh, has uh, started uh, three years ago uh, this process on looking to uh, chemicals in plastic to do a review uh, of chemicals and plastics. So uh, yes, this project I uh, handled or supported uh, the last uh, three years. Um, and in the first year, uh, we did a deep, uh, uh, we looked um, together uh, with uh, Peter Fanke and uh, Nicolo Orisano uh, into um, uh, chemicals in, in plastic and, 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 and published uh, from our side around uh, 6,000 chemicals here used in plastic. In parallel, uh, Zan Yun Wang from uh, EMPA and ETH uh, Zurich, they also did a deep dive into plastic uh, monomers additive and processing aids. So uh, he, when including also the processing aids, they found out uh, it is more than 10,000 uh, chemicals in plastic and uh, in our project we combined uh, the two lists and we found out that we have more than 30,000 chemicals which are present in plastic yeah and more than 3,200 of these chemicals have a potential concern this means they have a certain hazard property considering the global harmonized system and the European CLP um, categorization and um, to this uh, we will come then also later in the presentation. So thank you. Uh, and I thought uh, uh, in this presentation, I would like to uh, highlight here the human exposure and explain, uh, let's say some nitty gritty of human exposure from some plastic use priority sectors. Um, the project is uh, within uh, Stockholm Convention project, GMP. So therefore, yes, we will have an, an emphasis on POPs, but as you already uh, saw, uh, POPs are only uh, a part of the issue. Um, and we have, um, wait a moment. Yes. Um, we have uh, <laughs> many more issues. Um, so here, content of the presentation first on plastic and chemical pollution have uh, crossed the global boundaries. Then uh, Stockholm Convention POPs, which are used of these pops in plastic as, as plastic additives. 
then uh, shortly to the UNEP WHO pops in uh, human milk and contamination from plastic additives, which already Sandra mentioned. Then on plastic additive groups of concern and some health effects and uh, related external costs um, and uh, some part on human exposure to pops and uh, chemicals of concern, especially plastics uh, in, in buildings, but also plastics uh, indoor, um, including plastics uh, in synthetic carpets and uh, textiles, which are also mainly uh, indoor. And uh, the last part is on additives in toys and uh, children exposure. And uh, here I want to introduce a state of art exposure assessment uh, from plastics, which was also done by the group of uh, Professor Fanke uh, from uh, the Technical University in Denmark. Um, this, oops. this gives a good overview uh, from Geier uh, et al on the challenge of, uh, of the use challenge of um, plastic, of the global plastic production and the life cycle of plastic. So when we look uh, the last uh, 50 years between 1950s to uh, 2015, about uh, 8,300 uh, million tons of um, plastic has been produced. And uh, from this, we still have around 2,500 million tons in stock um, and 800 million tons have been incinerated over the last 70 years. But the largest part, this means uh, more than 50% of all these plastic have ended in landfills, in dump sites, um, on terrestrial areas, and um, about 120 million tons have ended in the oceans. Only about 600 million tons have been recycled over the last uh, 60 years. And uh, from this 600 million tons, today only still about 100 million tons are still in stock. Yeah. And uh, especially those uh, nearly 5,000 million tons um, on the terrestrial disposal and the 120 million tons which have entered the, the oceans uh, is actually the catastrophe or a catastrophe what we have in our world here. You see a few pictures here, two pictures about the marine pollution, what we have, and here uh, some terrestrial uh, pollution uh, in Asian countries where they have huge challenges to manage uh, the huge amount uh, of, of, of plastic. And uh, therefore, when uh, Pelson et al. in 2022 published uh, on the new entities um, of materials and uh, assessment of global boundaries, the uh, planetary boundaries, which are defined as the environmental limits within uh, which humanity can safely operate, uh, the group concluded that for plastic and uh, overall for chemicals, we have already crossed uh, global boundaries. And it is therefore a huge concern uh, for humanity and also a huge concern and a huge impact on ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are those services which, yes, the, the world uh, provide uh, us as humanity that we can uh, live, yeah. This from an let's say anthropogenic uh, perspective. Um, so therefore, it is clear that we cannot continue in this way. One part of the solution is, uh, of course, a reduction of plastic, yeah, better management of plastic, but. Another part is that we need to go more circular and best to go pure circular. So therefore, UN organization, the European Union, they are stressing uh, the circular economy uh, for plastic, but also for other materials. But 
When we move now to more circular economy, mean increasing the recycling rate from 6%, 8%, 10% to a higher rate, a big question is what is the fate of hazardous chemicals? So therefore, especially hazardous chemicals like POPs and other chemicals of concern need to be controlled. And uh, this is one recommendation uh, from our uh, report that they should be phased out and only used if they are essential and that this should be best uh, a global approach. And uh, why, let's say it's good uh, to have here now a webinar uh, on POPs and, and plastic is that with the Stockholm Convention, uh, we have a global convention, which is, uh, let's say, managing those uh, persistent organic pollutants, uh, which are, are have been listed uh, in the Stockholm Convention. In the beginning, these were uh, 12 POPs, but there was uh, no plastic additives, including, yes, I mean, PCB has also been used as a plastic additives. But over the last 14 years, 19 new POPs have been listed in the Stockholm Convention. And many of the new listed POPs are additives in plastic. And some of these POPs have or had high production volumes. This include, for example, the polybrominated diphenyl ethers, especially a high uh, production here for the deca bromodiphenyl ether, 1.6 million tons. Uh, also, hexabromocyclododecan is a high uh, product uh, additive. Um, then uh, we have uh, short chain chlorinated paraffins, um, which all have received exemptions in the Stockholm Convention, including uh, P4, perfluoranoic octanoic acid, uh, and can be also, they are listed as a pop, still be produced today. So here, when we look to uh, the brominated, yes, they are mainly used as uh, plastic additives, as, as flame retardants. Uh, when we look here to the, the fluorinated pops, like um, perfluorooctan sulfonic acid and um, perfluorooctanoic acid, so they are used in polymer production and especially are included in side chain fluoropolymers. Yeah, so they are here not uh, additives, but they are included here in the polymer itself. Or for P4, uh, which was uh, mainly used uh, for the production of um, PTFE um, and uh, highly released uh, from there. But this we will have tomorrow in a presentation on um, the fluorinated uh, chemicals related to uh, plastic. So also three of POP candidates, so these are not yet listed in the Stockholm Convention, are also plastic additives. So uh, this include the, the medium chain chlorinated paraffins, uh, here the first uh, UV stabilizer, UV328 and Declorant Plus. And so therefore the control and management of plastic containing POPs become a major task in implementing the Stockholm Convention and the impulse for management of uh, chemicals in, in plastic. And um, when we look uh, to, the, to, to the total uh, volume of uh, POPs and especially the POP uh, um, additives uh, produced, this is um, a figure from Lee et al, which have made a, a great overview in environmental science advance on uh, the total production and the historic production. So here you see uh, POP production started 90. 30 and uh, up here to, to 2020. And you see that um, some of the pop, uh, plastic additives have been produced in more than uh, 100,000 tons or even million tons, especially here for the for the PBDEs. And here is the, the, the DECA BDE, uh, but also here for the short chain uh, chlorinated uh, paraffins. So when you look here to the total amount, for example, for short chain chlorinated paraffins, it is the pops produced in largest amount of all pops in history. Today, we have about 8.8 .8 million tons of short chain chlorinated paraffins produced. This is twice the amount of the historic DDT production and production still continues. 
at a concentration of about or volume of about 400,000 tons a year. Then, uh, like I said, we have the 1.6 million tons of uh, DECA BDE uh, produced in the last 15 years. And when you just uh, consider around an average of 10% uh, of DECA BDE uh, in polymers, then you come to a total amount of 16 million tons of pop plastic and uh, related waste. And uh, the same for hexabromocyclodotican, it has been produced to about 0 0.7 million tons, um, has been produced until 2021, 90% of uh, uh, hexabromocyclodotican has been used in uh, extended and uh, extruded uh, polystyrene, uh, where in average about 1.5% of HBCD is used. So therefore you can calculate that in total 42 million tons of hexabromocyclodotican uh, containing EPS, XPS um, has been produced and largely used in insulation foam, which is still there and will need to be managed uh, the next century. So like I said, yes, uh, the issue is bigger. So it is not only, uh, let's say, uh, this uh, 10 plus uh, pop plastic additives, but uh, we have in total about 13,000 chemicals, 3,200 are an issue of concern. And um, we also need to address and control other hazardous additives, but uh, it is good uh, with the POPs globally to start uh, on, 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 on the issue. And uh, what we have done in our publication uh, was uh, to look to, let's say, major, uh, groups of chemicals of concern, uh, looking to uh, prominated uh, and halogenated flame retardants, um, to uh, uh, fluorinated uh, substances. Um, and there, I want to give you a short overview on uh, chemicals additives of concern uh, in, 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 in plastics, starting with the halogenated uh, flame retardants. So, a wide range of chemicals uh, with a large uh, production volume. We have here brominated flame retardants, yeah, where we have uh, different pops, different uh, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, where tomorrow we will have a detailed introduction into them. Uh, Hexabromocyclodotican, but we have also other major brominated flame aromatic flame retardants here, like the tetrabromobisphenol A. Uh, we have chlorinated flame retardants, uh, including also some uh, POPs, um, which are including short and medium chain chlorinated paraffins, short chain chlorinated paraffins already listed. Medium chain chlorinated paraffins are currently assessed and uh, might be listed uh, in a few years time. And for Dechloran Plus, this is already through the POP reviewing committee and will be suggested to be listed as a POP uh, next month in May at the Conference of Parties. So here, the functionality is to reduce flammability and reduce the spread of fire. Um, but it needs to be highlighted that uh, these halogenated flame retardant are not effective against uh, plastic burning. So if you have a fire, also this flame retarded uh, plastic is, uh, is, is burning. We have the major use. Uh, in insulation, electrical devices, vehicles, and, and textiles. And normally you have uh, them uh, that they are functional at concentrations between uh, 20 and 28%. Uh, and uh, when we look uh, to the human milk, uh, which was uh, already mentioned by, by Sandra, so we see that uh, brominated flame retardant, the hexabromo, um, the uh, polybrominated diphenyl ethers are uh, found uh, in quite uh, high levels here with a mean uh, concentration of 10 nanogram uh, per gram lipid, but uh, up to uh, 200 nanogram per gram uh, lipid in, in some countries. Uh, and uh, when we look here for uh, short chain uh, chlorinated paraffins uh, and medium chain pa pa chlorinated paraffins, together we see that they are already the second highest uh, pop uh, found uh, in, in, in human milk uh, globally uh, at levels of more than uh, 200 uh, nanogram per gram lipid in, in, in human milk. 
So only uh, DDT is higher because some countries, especially here in Africa, have a much higher co uh, concentration, while uh, in industrial countries um, and a range of Asian countries, already the chlorinated paraffins uh, have the highest concentration of POPs uh, in human milk. I have also here uh, added uh, <laughs> a red uh, marking for PCBs because uh, PCBs uh, were also used um, as an additive uh, in polymers, and I will uh, come to that uh, later. And actually, um, the, the, the use uh, of open uses, uh, like as in, in polymers, like in sealants, uh, had a high relevance for uh, human exposure overall, which I will show later. Um, when we look here to PBDEs uh, and uh, human milk levels, we learn something about application and we learn something about uh, policy making. So we see that the concentration of PBDEs in human milk is very different between different countries. By far, the highest level of PBDEs here in 2003 um, was in the United States with more than 200 nanogram per gram of uh, PBDEs uh, uh, per, per lipid. And uh, when you look to the neighboring countries of United States like Haiti or Antigua, Mexico, uh, Jamaica, Barbados, yeah, so they are the countries with, which have also high levels. And basically, the main driver was here the largest use of commercial Penta BDE, which is the main driver of human exposure to PBDEs. So the deca bromodiphenyl ether uh, in human milk is quite low. Why? Because we can metabolize them nicely while the lower chlorinated uh, tetra and penta and hexa uh, BDEs, uh, we uh, need more time to metabolize it. So the largest share of commercial penta BDE has been used in, in, in North America, about 90%. And the main reason was there were specific flammability standards, for example, in, in furniture and in transport. We have explained that and described that in a review article, which I recommend you to look at. And uh, for the other countries, the levels are much lower because the flammability standards were different. Yeah. So most of the countries have uh, 100 times less PBDE levels in human milk compared to the United States. Another thing to highlight is uh, in the United States, there were a good assessment about health, health impacts. And uh, it is concluded here by Atina 2016 and in, in Lancet that the cost of IQ loss and intellectual disability in the United States due to uh, PBDEs is estimated to $266 billion per year, yeah, driven by flammability standard and driven by the high use of this commercial Penta BDE. And the reason that there was so a high use of flame retardants in the United States was that the flame retardant industry and the cigarette industry pushed for flammability standards, which require high use. And this is uh, documented um, by the Chicago uh, Tribune. So they had a, a, a series um, and they explained here in uh, several uh, great articles how the flame retardant and cigarette industry pushed for flammability standards in the United States, that there was this requirement of high use of flame retardants in furniture vehicles, but even in children's sleepwear. And I recommend everybody um, of you to have a look to these articles because they are really teaching and they are showing that at least some decades ago, the industry lobbied with really uh, false science for flammability standards. Um, so this is, uh, let's say more detail about this Athena uh, study. Uh, in respect to the external cost uh, from in the United States here uh, for the for the PBDEs uh, and uh, for what kind of uh, disability, uh, but 
what I would like to highlight is that uh, when you look to these studies, you see it's not only PBDEs, but there are other plastic additives in this um, in this study, like um, the phthalate, some phthalates, yeah, which have uh, high external costs, and some uh, uh, bisphenol, uh, or including also bisphenol A, yeah. Um, and uh, by this study, you already get an idea uh, what is the health relevance, yeah, of these uh, plastic additives for our society. A similar study was also uh, conducted uh, for the European Union, uh, here published uh, by Trasande et al. And uh, they estimated that in total, uh, the external cost in Europe um, for endocrine disrupting chemicals uh, were more than 150 billion uh, uh, euro uh, per year. So this is already in the percentage. Uh, of uh, the, the GDP of, of Europe and uh, the effect for PBDE, uh, the estimate is here 9 billion euro. Yeah, so this means considerable lower, uh, about 50 times lower, uh, no, uh, for, for 30 times lower uh, compared to the United States um, because also we have 30 times lower use of uh, PBDEs in Europe compared to America, especially for the commercial Pinta PDE. And also in Europe, uh, other um, plastic additives are considered to have a high uh, endocrine impact and external costs, uh, even higher here for the PBDEs. These are for phthalates and for uh, bisphenol A, estimated uh, to uh, 26 uh, billion. Uh, euro per year. Uh, the highest cost here for Europe are not plastic additives. Uh, so the highest cost here estimate is uh, are, are for pesticides. Yeah. Um, good. So yes, coming uh, to the next uh, plastic additive group, which I already kind of introduced you here with the external costs and their relevance. So these are phthalates, yeah, which you have seen, they are considered uh, in the United States assessment of endocrine disruptors and external cost, but also uh, uh, in, in Europe and have here even a higher cost uh, compared to the, to the PBDEs. So phthalates are high production volume chemicals. They are largely used as a plasticizer in different plastics, uh, in particular in, in, in PVC between 10 and 60% or I said very soft PVC also can have 70% of, of plasticizer. And also here phthalates can be released during the whole plastic life uh, cycle. And this you also understand when you have a PVC, which is getting older 20, 30 years ago, uh, it gets uh, more, more, more brittle. And the reason it gets more brittle is that the, the plasticizer, including for example, phthalates get out of it. So many are subjected already from these phthalates to various chemical legislation. Um, so these phthalates are not under the Stockholm Convention because they are not uh, persistent uh, enough and bioaccumulating uh, enough. So therefore, uh, they are then regulated under diff other uh, restriction, for example, in the European uh, reach, uh, for example, in toys and indoor and outdoor uh, articles. Then uh, another important group are the, the bisphenols, yeah, where I also showed for Europe, uh, they are considered to have a quite considerable impact uh, in respect to, to health costs. So here, uh, the most uh, famous and the most produced is uh, the bisphenol A. We have here uh, for all these bisphenols, uh, two aromatic uh, groups and uh, with uh, hydroxy groups. And the difference here between uh, this bisphenol A or the bisphenol S is here just uh, the, the group which is uh, combining here these uh, two phenyl rings. So we have bisphenol S and uh, bisphenol F, which uh, are proposed as an uh, alternative uh, from industry, but uh, where already, uh, let's say, science have found that they also have, uh, let's say, health implications and might not be a good idea. Uh, to be used as an alternative. So bisphenol A, the major use was to make polycarbonates in the million tons a year. 
uh, also for making epoxy resins. These are liners for food cans, for example. And a bisphenol A can migrate from containers uh, of food or beverages, uh, depending on the quality uh, of, of, of the, the resin produced, or uh, for example, uh, if uh, polycarbonate is treated uh, with uh, strong surfactants, also they can uh, degrade and uh, polycarbonate can then release um, bisphenol A, for example, uh, into, into food. Uh, already since 1930, it's known uh, that there are that uh, bisphenol A has uh, to tox toxic effects. Like um, and then during the the, the years, uh, more uh, toxic effects have been found, including immunotoxicity, metabolic effects, neuro uh, toxicity, and what we see over the last uh, 40 years is that the safe levels, this mean a tolerable daily intake or the reference doses get lower and lower. So in the beginning, it was uh, 50 milligram per kilogram per day uh, set by the United States uh, in 1982. And uh, the most recent one from the European Food Safety Authority, uh, which is at the moment a draft, is uh, here uh, that the tolerable daily intake might need to be reduced to 0 0.04 nanogram per kilogram per day yeah this mean i don't know if more than five orders seven, seven orders uh, of magnitude lower um another um chemical group of concern related to plastic are the per and polyfluorinated alkylated substances so i do not uh, say any uh thing to uh, this group here because we will have tomorrow a really excellent presentation uh from Professor Ian Cassins, who know the subject much better than me. So I recommend you then to listen on that um, chemical group uh, tomorrow. And when we look now just to the four groups, uh, which I have introduced you as a, a chemical additive, to their mixture effect of plastic additives. Uh, and uh, the effect here, and I take uh, the sperm quality, which have decreased in Europe, but also other uh, industrial countries uh, by 50% uh, over the last 60 years, that when we look to the mixture toxicity of plastic additives, that we see that from the 29 chemicals, which have been uh, assessed, and that's a review article from Corting Camp et al. from 2022, um, a large share of these 29 chemicals, which have an impact on the sperm quality, a large share of these chemicals are related to plastics. And this includes androgen receptor antagonistic effects from bisphenol A, F, and S. Uh, also, uh, PBDEs are uh, androgen receptor antagonists and PC, some, some of the PCBs. Then we have the suppression of testosterone synthesis. This includes uh, different uh, phthalates. Then uh, we have uh, AH uh, activations. Um, including uh, polychlorinated biphenyls. So also here we have a correlation of uh, de decreasing sperm quality and also for PFOS and P4R and organophosphorus esters, we have, uh, we see an, an, an epidemiological uh, effect uh, on, on, on sperm quality, but the, um, the mechanism how this chemical works uh, to, to decrease uh, the sperm quality is, uh, is not known. Yeah, but what we know is that uh, plasticized and flame retarded sperms do not function as they should. Uh, impressive study from the United States, which I really like, is uh, from Mika and Stapleton from 2010. So um, they have looked uh, into reasons why the sperm quality in the United States uh, decreased and have uh, done here a sampling of um, a house dust. Uh, and here uh, they have uh, looked into the concentration of uh, phosphorus, organophosphorus flame retardants, the TPP here, and the other one is uh, the TDCPP. This is a, a, a chlorinated uh, phosphorus flame retardant, but uh, here you see here the, the correlation in their study uh, between the concentration in house dust and the sperm uh, concentration of the people living in the respective house. 
And what they have found is that they could make a correlation of the concentration of these phosphorus flame retardants in house dust and association of 18% uh, for the TPP uh, and uh, more than 30% decline in sperm concentration when adjusted to age, body mass index, and abstin abstinence period. So quite impressive. And uh, in the cotton cum study, he has uh, measured um, chemicals uh, in urine uh, and have uh, looked then for 98 men in respect to the hazard index. And uh, what he found is that um, they that all 98 men were highly exposed um, and had a combined exposure that exceed the index value sometimes by more than 100 fold. And the median of these 98 men was an exceedent, exceedance of the hazard index by 17 fold. And um, bisphenol A was here a main driver, followed by other bisphenol S and F, while normally the phthalates in his study uh, had an hazard index uh, of less than one. Yeah, but finally, yes, it is the sum of the different uh, chemicals and the impact here on the, 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 or the risk uh, and the, the, the pressure on the sperm quality. So therefore, mixture toxicity of plastic additive is a risk to sperm quality in Europe and contributes to continued sperm decrease, one of the conclusion of that study. Coming to um, the fifth uh, chemical additive uh, group of concern um, in plastic, which are UV stabilizers. So UV stabilizers protect plastic from photo degradation initiated by UV light and thus uh, decrease plastic weatherability. So here we have uh, the benzophenones, uh, mainly used for polyolefins and, and PVC, which absorb then the, the ultraviolet light at, at, at a certain uh, wavelength. Then we have uh, the benzotriazoles, uh, which are mainly used in transparent plastic materials such as ABS, HIPS, uh, PVC, uh, polycarbonate. And we have the hindered amine light stabilizers, uh, which are mainly used uh, in polyolefins and uh, styrenics, uh, polyamides, polyuretans. And uh, when we look to regulatory action, we see that some of the, the benzotriazoles are substances of very high concern in, in, in Europe including UV 320, 327, 328, and 350. And the first UV stabilizer, which is at the same time the first non-halogenated uh, um, chemical, is uh, now proposed as a candidate pop in the Stockholm Convention and might be listed uh, in next, just this May, this mean next month in the, in the Stockholm Convention. Also, uh, the hindered amine light stabilizers are classi classified as very uh, toxic, class three in the European Union and in the United States. Uh, they are regulating some of the hulls uh, for food contact materials. And when we look to the bisphenols, they are ecotoxic and have potential to uh, in uh, induce uh, allergies. Then, uh, quickly to another chemical group, um, which are chemicals of concern. These are the alkyl phenols, uh, main uh, alkyl phenol here, where the regulators have uh, looked uh, the last uh, 10 years is non phenol, which is used as catalytic diluent in epoxy resins and an intermediate to produce uh, non phenol etylate, uh, etoxylates which are surfactants in various applications, dispersing or stabilizing agents in plastic and rubber. Um, also barium and calcium salts uh, of uh, nonyl uh, phenol is used as, as heat stabilizers. So therefore nonyl phenols can be present in plastics and rubber uh, as a residual and degradation product and can be released here uh, during the life cycle. Nonylphenol is also an endocrine disrupting chemical and is restricted, for example, in the, in the European Union. Another chemical additive group of concern are biocides. So biocides are antimicrobial substances to protect uh, plastics from attack and degradation.
by microorganisms, for example, here, uh, tri triclosan, which is uh, partly used in, in polyethylene, polypropylene, or PVC. Then uh, also uh, organic tin compounds are used sometimes uh, in, in plastics, uh, in some polyurethane and PVC applications, or some arsenic compounds. Biocides are problematic. For example, they cause health and environmental hazards since they can strongly interact with uh, living organisms. And for humans, they can uh, cause allergic uh, uh, contact dermatitis and, for example, asthma. Then uh, biocides in packaging are regulated in industrial countries uh, in the US, for example, by the federal uh, food and drug and cosmetic um, act in the European Union by a biocidal uh, products and regulation. But often for developing countries, and today uh, we have uh, most participants come from developing countries, South America, Africa, Asia, many Asian countries. Uh, in many of the countries, all these chemical groups which I have introduced, or most of the chemical groups which I have introduced, are not uh, really regulated. Yeah. Um, and here, especially with POPs, let's say we have now some years uh, where um, POPs are regulated in those countries, and therefore I think that um, Stockholm Convention can be a good start, let's say, to manage these kind of uh, plastic additives. Another and maybe the second last group of chemical additives of concern are metals and metalloids, uh, including, for example, mercury, uh, which is used or was used as catalyst in, in polyurethane foam, might still be used in some uh, developing countries. Uh, we have uh, lead as heat stabilizers or UV stabilizers uh, in, in PVC, uh, same for, 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 for cadmium. Um, they are also uh, uh, of concern also, let's say the migration of metals is normally relatively small out of plastics. But when we look to the developing countries, finally end of life often, it is open burning and open burning of plastic containing heavy metals are releasing all the heavy metals because they are perfectly persistent. And the last, uh, let's say a chemical group of concern are not additives, but they are non-intentionally added substances, so-called NIAS. So here, uh, non-intentional uh, chemicals are co-present in plastic, but are not intentionally added during production and processing. And they can include unreacted residuals of raw materials and intermediates, can include impurities in raw materials, can include reaction byproducts, breakdown and degradation products, contaminants during production and processing, and also additives can become NIAS in recycling. Yeah, this means if you have, for example, uh, electronic uh, plastic, and then uh, this plastic uh, is recycled into a toy, then the brominated flame retardant in the toy is not an additive. Yeah. Uh, also, it does not uh, really help for the function. Normally, it is less than 1,000 ppm uh, in, in, in plastic toys after the recycling. So then also uh, plastic additives by recycling can become uh, NIAS uh, in recycling. Also, NIAS can include unintentional POPs, such as uh, dioxins or PCBs or hexachlorobenzenes. For example, in pigment additives, some of the pigments contain dioxins. And when you then add pigments, which include uh, dioxins or PCBs or hexachlorobenzenes, then also dioxins and PCBs uh, can become um, plastic additives, uh, no, <laughs> uh, in the in the plastic. Um, we have also looked uh, in our study, uh, not only to chemicals um, groups of concern, but also uh, to chemicals in plastic uh, priority sectors, um, including, yes, uh, uh, toys, uh, building materials, uh, textiles, uh, electronics, uh, vehicles, uh, furniture, packaging. And uh, in this presentation, I only uh, want to select, let's say, these uh, kind of indoor uh, uh, uses of, of plastics um, and, and, and toys. Uh, 
to highlight this kind of exposure from chemicals to, to plastics. So why I have uh, chosen this kind of indoor ex exposure because indoor exposure is uh, very relevant for acute exposure events. So here the indoor is a main driver of acute exposure. And also when you look to lifetime uh, average exposure, uh, also the indoor exposure is highly relevant. Yeah, so also this is an outcome of the study from uh, Funke's uh, group in the Technical University. So indoor environment contributes greatly to human exposure and can be a major contributor for certain chemicals, including plastic additives in the Northern Hemisphere. The time spent indoor is approximately 90% of people. This includes home, workplace, and also transport. This means in also uh, the, when you sit in a car, this contributes. For the Southern Hemisphere, this might be lower than the 90%, uh, but uh, yes, uh, not much lower. So. The WHO estimates that indoor air pollution is responsible for close to 4 million deaths per year. A large share of this comes from indoor cooking and heating, yeah, using uh, these low-tech uh, stoves. But what we see is that uh, with increasing plastic use as a fuel, uh, also plastic uh, play more and more uh, relevance. And uh, when we sampled here now the plastic pellets for our uh, current project in Nigeria, um, we found out that a major or that uh, a, a relevant um, part of the recycling or, or reuse of plastic is, is afterwards uh, for heating purposes. Um, for indoor exposure uh, of major pops um, in industrial plastic uses, uh, I'm looking here and relevant are building and construction materials. Here you see it's also at the same time a major use of plastics, 65 million tons a year. Also textiles, um, which contribute to indoor exposure, nearly 60 million tons. Um, and then we have uh, uh, also uh, for the transportation, 27 million tons um, and consumer products uh, uh, for electronics, 18 million tons. And many of those plastic materials are used indoor and released additives indoor. So this I showed before. So when we look, for example, for the for the building and construction materials, we see yes, a PVC is a, is a major uh, use uh, of plastic uh, indoor. And as we have learned uh, in the last presentation, um, we have a large amount of, of additives uh, in PVC, especially in the soft PVC, which is used, for example, uh, for, for flooring, but also, uh, for example, for toys. So major additives uh, used uh, uh, indoor. I don't, yeah. um, in buildings and in textiles, uh, uh, we have, uh, for example, the PCBs, which have been used in polymer sealants. Uh, the so-called thiocol sealants uh, in buildings, but also in PVC coatings and paints and in cables, yeah, especially from 1950s to 1980s. Hexabromocyclododecan has been mainly used in buildings, um, especially in uh, EPS and XPS uh, insulation until um, 2021 uh, in um, in, in, in China, in Europe here until 2017. Uh, also, HPCD has been used in, in, in textiles until about 2013. Then we have the PBDEs and other brominated flame retardants, which are used in polyethylene, polypropylene foils, in polyurethane, but also in roller blinds and in curtains. Um, they are, have been used in polyurethane uh, spray foams. When we look to short and medium chain chlorinated paraffins, they uh, are used in plasticizers and flame retardants in PVC, but also uh, which is used then in flooring, roofing, or uh, cables. Um, we have sealant materials like uh, the rigid polyurethane foam, where um, chlorinated paraffins are heavily used. And we have the UV328, uh, the pop candidate, which are used. Uh, partly as UV filter in polymers uh, used uh, in construction. 
Then we have phosphorus flame retardants, um, where you have seen the study of, of, of Mika and, and Stapleton before, uh, with uh, indoor uh, release uh, and contamination of house dust. We have uh, phthalates, uh, which is used in PVC um, and released uh, to indoor and the house dust. And we have bisphenol A, for example, in polycarbonates, um, which are used uh, for windows and, and skylights. Uh, wall panels and, and roof domes. Here, the release is not uh, that uh, relevant compared to the phthalates uh, in, in, in PVC. And we have uh, cadmium and, 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 and uh, lead stabilizers, but also for them, let's say the release uh, into indoor is uh, relatively uh, small. Um, I would uh, just uh, look to uh, two or three chemicals here, and I would like to start with uh, PCBs because uh, we have made really a learning from the past, from the past, from PCB in buildings and indoor pollution. So here, uh, um, the main use or a main use of uh, PVC in open application. And uh, from the 1.3 million tons, about 215,000 uh, tons of PCBs have been used in this open application Yeah, between 1950s and 1970s, mainly from industrial countries. So um, they have been used especially here in these kind of sealants. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, these pictures I made uh, around um, 2018. So that's my older university where we checked that uh, the university was been, has been built in the end of 1960s, early 70s. And most of the indoor sealants and outdoor sealants were still present there. And uh, these sealants are mainly uh, used in, in prefabricated buildings. Um, in Germany, we have about 33% of kindergartens and schools which have been affected or which are still affected by these uh, PCB sealants. And due to the long lifetime of these sealants in buildings of the last 30 to 16 years or even longer, a considerable share of these sealants is still present. And also PCB coatings uh, were used in the buildings and are still uh, be present. Sometimes they are uh, repainted. But then if they are repainted, still the PCB can migrate to the next paint layer and can go indoor. So I just tell you here the German, our German experience, uh, especially here in West Germany, we have used 24,000 tons of PCBs in building sector, mainly in sealants. So this is the largest use of PCB in open application in the world. Uh, when we recalculate it to uh, the population in West Germany, it's about 360 gram uh, PCB in open application per person. And we have made a study uh, between 2013 and uh, 2018 in respect to uh, PCB contamination of environment. And in this frame, we have evaluated um, this uh, PCB materials. And we have estimated that about 40 to 70% of these PCB materials from these 24,000 tons are still present. Germany, we have a PCB regulation. And in 1995, uh, it was based on the tolerable daily intake of 1,000 nanogram PCB per kilogram of body weight. And when you have this tolerable daily intake, you can calculate that a concentration of 3,000 nanogram per cubic meter uh, is enough uh, to reach the tolerable daily intake. So therefore, there is a um, in the PCB in the German PCB regulation that building uh, should be remediated if the PCB air concentration is above 3,000 nanogram per cubic meter. In 2003, then the WHO re-evaluated the tolerable daily intake of PCBs, and the WHO set 20 nanogram per kilogram body weight per day. This means they reduce the tolerable daily intake by a factor of 50. And if we also reduce here then the, the this recalculated tolerable daily intake uh, to uh, the air concentration indoor, uh, it is then a 60 nanogram per cubic meter. So the German government did not change uh, the regulation. So it's still uh, today this 3000 nanogram per cubic meter. Um, and uh, I don't know if this is a reason, but uh, the 60 nanogram per cubic meter is basically impossible to reach if you have a PCB building. So even if you do a remediation of a building, 
the building indoor will be above 60 nanogram PCB per, per cubic meter. And uh, if you would set these 60 nanogram per cubic meter, this would mean uh, that uh, universities, kindergartens would need to be uh, closed, yeah, uh, or very strong measures uh, would need to be done. There are some, but which are very expensive. So therefore, PCB are the first plastic additives which result that buildings need remediation. And today, buildings are sometimes broken down due to PCB contamination. Yeah. So sometimes in Germany now, when there is an evaluation, what we do with the buildings, do we renovate the PCBs or not? Um, buildings uh, are de demolished, but you know, these buildings are now also 50 years old. So uh, there is, uh, let's say, uh, really an evaluation of uh, what is the cost. So therefore, kindergarten, school and children, students and academia are still exposed in thousands uh, of buildings in Europe and uh, United States. And when you look uh, what what happens uh, here in this respect to, to PCB contamination, there are ongoing liability activities of PC, for PCB producers in respect to health effects in the United States, especially here for Monsanto and Bayer, yeah, which joined to one company. So these two companies together, they are responsible for approximately 70% of all PCB produced in the past. So uh, Monsanto Bayer, they are facing recent legal cases and li litigation risks in the United States. So they have Bayer has on their website also uh, own part of managing and mitigating the US PCB litigation risk. Uh, but recently, let's say that's 2022, there uh, a, a, a court here uh, decided that uh, $275 million uh, uh, would need to be paid here from uh, Monsanto uh, in the latest trial here for PCB exposure of, of teachers in the Washington State School or here from 2021, uh, here Monsanto in, 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 a, in a court case, um, uh, we are concluded that they have to pay uh, 185 uh, million uh, for, for teachers uh, in respect to uh, uh, brain uh, uh, damage, yeah? So you see, this is still uh, uh, relevant. Yeah, we have exposure um, and, um, we have uh, done a more detailed assessment of this kind of PCB release uh, in our German study, but also the US EPA in recent years. So here, uh, Thomas et al. has evaluated how much PCB is actually uh, still going out of these uh, sealants. Here, um, for 6.4 meter long sealant, this sealant contained 14% PCBs. The estimate was 2.8 gram of PCB release uh, to indoor uh, per year, or here, two studies um, for a university building in in uh, in Germany. We have done an assessment. So these buildings had this building had about one ton of PCBs in sealants and paints, uh, and uh, you, we we could calculate the air emission uh, because we have the air concentration, and from the air concentration we could calculate the exchange rate of air from the building, and from there we could calculate that 600 gram of PCB are released every year from this building. And when we recalculate this to the total amount of PCB in this building, we can calculate that this is about 0.06% release rate from PCB. And this was uh, really nice because there is also a study in Sweden and they have also done a similar assessment for a building. And uh, in their calculation, it was a release rate of around 0.07% of PCB from this uh, polymer sealants a year. And you can calculate here for this PCB additive in sealants, it has more than 1,000 year uh, release. So PCBs, unfortunately, have been substituted uh, by uh, short chain chlorinated paraffins and medium chain chlorinated paraffins here in the 1970s, for example, in sealants and paints and in cable. Um, what has happened with, uh, with the chlorinated paraffins over the last uh, 20 years? Um, the production has very strongly increased, especially the production in China and India has, has increased. Today, we have about 1.4 million tons of production of uh, um, mainly short and medium chain chlorinated paraffins together. The largest 
uh, share are used in PVC. The estimate for China is that uh, around 70% of short and medium chain chlorinated paraffins are used uh, in, um, in PVC. And you have seen that about 50% of all PVC are going into the buildings. Yeah. So this study has been conducted, a real great study from uh, Beijing University, uh, Chen et al. I was also part of that team. So they have analyzed 124 products, um, including um, uh, different uh, PVC products, uh, polyurethane foams, um, uh, po um, um, rubber materials um, for the uh, chlorinated paraffin uh, concentration uh, and average uh, chlorinated paraffin concentration. And from those, they have recalculated the, the total amount uh, which uh, have um, been used in this uh, product in China. And uh, there is a, a second recent study um, from 2023 from Wang et al. Uh, Wang et al, sorry. Um, so they have uh, analyzed PVC curtains. And in this um, PVC curtain, uh, the short and medium chain chlorinated paraffin um, was about 30% of total weight. And then they have measured the air release. And uh, they found out that from the air release and from indoor intake air and dust, that only from these one curtain indoor, there is 165 nanogram per kilogram per day uh, uh, exposure um, for an adult and for 500, more than 500 nanogram per kilogram per day uh, for a toddler. So they concluded that the result indicate that curtains, these PVC curtains, just as one example, could pose considerable health risk through inhalation and uh, dermal contact to short and medium chain chlorinated paraffins. And I can encourage all researchers here, you can do similar studies, let's say for flooring or uh, wall uh, roofing. Another impressive study here for uh, indoor, uh, for use, uh, in, in construction is uh, polyurethane foam. So up to 50% in this European study uh, from Brandsma et al. 2021 uh, was uh, partly uh, additive here in this polyurethane foam. You see here mainly the blue one is the medium chain chlorinated paraffin, partly also long chain chlorinated paraffin up to 50% in this polyurethane foam. Yeah. Other uh, flame retardants here, phosphorus flame retardant, uh, also heavily used in this polyurethane foam. And uh, what was impressive in this study, they also analyzed uh, polyurethane, these are the, the new polyurethane foam, the new products, and these are polyurethane uh, used uh, products. And what you see here, that these products, the used products, has considerable lower concentration of chlorinated uh, paraffins and phosphorus flame retardants which uh, indicate that over these, let's say, 20, 30 years of use of polyurethane foam, a considerable amount of these additives have been released into the environment. Uh, that short and medium chain chlorinated paraffins are heavily uh, released into the environment is also seen by this study from Brits et al. in uh, uh, South uh, Africa. So they have measured house dust and they found that in South African house dust, the mean concentration um, of uh, short chain and medium chain uh, chlorinated paraffin were 130 and 230 milligram per kilogram of dust. This means PPM level, yeah? And up to 660 milligram per kilogram, yeah? And um, so this indicates that large, short and medium chain uh, chlorinated paraffin sources in African private houses and exist, yeah, and the main probable source is uh, PVC. I will show tomorrow in my presentation on uh, short and medium chain chlorinated paraffins more details. Coming uh, to the, I don't want, to the strong growth of, uh, to, the, to the textile, um, to the use of additives and chemicals in textiles, uh, and uh, related exposure, only a few slides. So for textile, we have also a strong increase of use overall. And when you look uh, the, to the type of textiles, you see that over the, the, the last uh, uh, five decades, 
uh, the, the polyester or PET uh, has uh, meanwhile about 50% of all textiles produced. So also let's say textile is a big part of uh, plastic production. So this is a, a slide from uh, Dr. Nimkar um, from uh, Nimkar Tech. Uh, so uh, he highlighted in a presentation that more than 5,000 chemicals are used in the products of textiles at different stages and that a particular high use of additives are in synthetic uh, textiles, yeah, like this, uh, this polyester. And when we look uh, into indoor use, uh, most of the textiles are used indoor, <laughs> except of the outdoor textiles, but also let's say the outdoor textiles, <laughs> the largest time, they are also indoor somewhere in a, in a locker. Uh, so therefore, Yes, a wide range of textiles are used uh, indoor and these additives in textiles can be released uh, indoor. And uh, when you look into, uh, into your house dust, uh, for example, we had a red carpet uh, when our daughter was, was born. So after that, uh, after a few weeks, our house dust uh, became red. So you see how much textiles can contribute uh, to, the, to the house dust uh, finally. And there is one uh, good exposure study on brominated flame retardants from textiles to humans. So that's uh, from the group of uh, Abdallah and Harrod uh, from um, Birmingham University. So they have uh, assessed a total exposure to hexabromocyclododecan and did an assessment of textile exposure directly to the skin and the uptake, uptake of the skin. And their conclusion was that there is a high exposure risk of hexabromocyclododecan for toddlers um, from um, uh, house dust, yeah, which main, like I said, which mainly come from this uh, textile release. We see that also when we look to hexabromocyclodecan content of house dust in, in UK compared to, for example, house dust here in, in Germany or Sweden. Yeah, in UK, you have a much higher uh, content. Yeah, and uh, UK also here, we have the flammability standards. So UK has the flammability standard for furniture. That, um, that flame retardants uh, need to be used kind of. Uh, and we see that for adults and for toddlers, this direct exposure from furniture textile is relevant. Yeah? But this is actually the only study I have uh, seen uh, for this direct pop exposure from, from textile. And also here, I would like to in encourage uh, governments and also uh, the researchers here to do more studies into this direct exposure from textiles uh, to people. Then, in addition to textiles, we have carpets uh, indoor. So carpets in the European Union con can contain um, more than uh, or around 59, up to 59 hazardous substances, including brominated flame retardants, phosphorus flame retardants, PFAS, phthalates. Uh, many of them are of these substances are carcinogens and mutagens. Um, they can be uh, toxic to reproduction and uh, be endocrine disruptors for these 59 identified substances in this study. 10 are identified by the European Union as substances of very high concern, and four of them are on the authorization list of uh, the European Union and are banned. And also here, just one study from Wu et al. from 2020. So they have analyzed uh, synthetic, uh, uh, they, they have analyzed uh, dust here in childcare centers in the United States, and they have found a correlation between uh, the, the carpets and the house dust of, of uh, uh, PFAS. And also these data suggest that PFAS from carpets are playing an important role for the indoor exposure, yeah, at least here for toddlers. So therefore, when we look into indoor release of this chemical mixture from product sectors, the um, Plastics and polymer play a major role. Yeah, we have building materials, we have carpets and textiles and clothing, and uh, additionally we have uh, electronics and furniture, and we have a whole range of pops and other chemicals of concern, which are released uh, into the indoor environment uh, and uh, where we are exposed. So. Uh, this is from uh, the review article of, of Lucatini, and Lucatini in his uh, review article here has also put here the, the concentration levels uh, of this kind of uh, many of them pl plastic additives um, in the in the indoor environment. Where yes, we see the, sh the the chlorinated paraffins have here the highest indoor concentration, 
Um, there are uh, siloxanes, not listed as pop yet, uh, but assessed uh, in respect, they are pop properties, um, partly from sealants, but yes, they have uh, also different sources like uh, cosmetics. So uh, therefore, yes, uh, plastic additives are uh, uh, relevant here for indoor exposure. And the last one, to toys, I wanted to come to the exposure. Uh, partly for indoor, but also toys uh, have, of course, a, a direct exposure. When we look to uh, toys, uh, the toy industry is a very plastic intensive industry. 90% of toys in the market are made from plastics. Children, in particular, those below the age of 36 months are considerable uh, and vulnerable to chemical exposure due to their physical uh, logical differences and uh, their development. Uh, and different exposure pattern. So we have here from toys uh, uh, adsorption by skin. They can volatize to the air and be inhaled, and they can ingest it during mouthing, uh, and also then uh, from dust particles from the release to these toys. And for this study, a really excellent study has uh, been published in 2021, again, from the group of Peter Fanke, yeah, who is also one of the lead author of our study on chemicals in plastic. So he, uh, with his uh, PhD student, um, Nicolo Orisano, have uh, published on chemicals of concern in, in plastic toys. And uh, this, I would like it as, as, a, as a last contribution, show as a, let's say, state-of-the-art study how to evaluate uh, chemicals in plastic. So here they have assessed um, and found that there are 456 chemical material combinations uh, of uh, different uh, polymers, uh, different additives, and they have concluded that 55 of these chemical material combinations in toys have a higher uh, hazardous index uh, than one. And uh, they have then looked into details of the exposure and toxicity uh, results and the different uh, exposure routes here for the non-cancer risk. And uh, they found that here the hazard quotient is uh, one for many plastics. And for some plastics, it's even above 10. And for a few plastics, uh, especially those uh, uh, which were using a uh, plasticizer, of soft uh, plastic toys, uh, especially PVC, they have a hazardous a hazard co uh, coefficient of more than uh, 100. Yeah. Uh, also, they have calculated uh, a cancer risk, uh, and also here uh, they they found uh, for some of the um, additives and 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 plastic co combinations uh, that uh, they have uh, relatively high. Uh, uh, cancer risk, uh, children cancer risk, and also here the driver or the, the highest uh, um, risk came from soft uh, plastic toys. Yeah, so uh, this study I would recommend everybody in the room, <laughs> or yes, no, not in the room, yeah, in, in the virtual room, yeah, um, in your countries uh, to have a look at it and uh, to use such kind of studies as a, as a role model also to look uh, to, to, to other uh, uses and uh, do the, the appropriate risk assessment. Yeah. Finally, at the end of the presentation, I want to come back uh, to the circular economy. Yeah, and uh, highlighting, yes, I have shown you now, let's say a big part of, of pops in plastic, but also other chemicals of concern uh, where we really need to take care when we are now going to circular economy, not to contaminate uh, uh, plastic uh, products, especially those with uh, sensible exposure. And uh, as, a, as a last slide here, I wanted to show you a study from the <clears throat> International uh, Pollutants Elimination Network, IPEN. So they have assessed uh, consumer products, including toys uh, in, in seven African countries, and they found in a range of toys a quite uh, uh, a relevant level of PBDEs, um, 270 ppm of PBDEs, 180 p uh, ppm of PBDEs, 315 ppm uh, uh, of PBDEs, which are all below the European regulation. Yeah, so that would be okay. But uh, 
when you analyze here the dioxin concentration, yeah, which are nias, non-intentional added substances um, coming uh, into these uh, products, um, the study show that the TEQ level here of the dioxins are comparable and higher compared to uh, fly ashes from an incinerator. Yeah, fly ashes in an incinerator normally have about 1,000 picogram TEQ. Yeah, if you have a good incinerator, maybe it's 100 picogram TEQ. Yeah, so here uh, this car toy, for example, has six times uh, the, the amount of, of, of dioxins here, prominated dioxins uh, in, in the toy compared to, to fly ash. Yeah, thank you for your attention. That was a heavy one. I hope you could follow. Yeah, sorry for the long presentation. But uh, yes, I wanted to give you, let's say, <laughs> a good overview on these uh, uh, chemicals of, of concern. And um, okay. Two o'clock. Yes. So now we can move to questions. Lisa, have you seen some questions in the chat? Yes. Um, so one of the first questions that we have is, what are the most significant impacts on the environment from a typical plastic recycling plant and what environmental management plan should be considered? Okay. Um, <laughs> of course, this depends on the recycling plant, right? Um, and uh, on the abatement technologies, this means best available technology, best environmental practice. Yeah. Um, so if you have a, a good uh, recycling plant, um, which is operating uh, uh, according to best, um, best uh, uh, available te techniques and best environmental practice, I would say that the recycling plant can have a quite low uh, impact of plastic, uh, uh, of, of impact into the environment. We have for all plastic recycling plants, of course, the risk of fires. Yeah, so here also in Germany, we have sometimes fires in all type of recycling plants, including uh, plastic recycling plants. So let's say this can be a, a driver of environmental uh, uh, releases. Um, and uh, then, yes, it depends how they how they manage uh, uh, plastic. Yeah, I mean, uh, we will see later in a presentation uh, from uh, Yuyun Ishvan, Ishvan Mati, yeah, uh, that there can be in developing countries, a, a huge impact uh, from plastic uh, recycling and uh, facilities uh, to, the, to, the, to the environment. Yeah. So here, yes. Um, yeah, it depends really on the, on the quality of the of the of the plastic of the of the plastic recycling plant. Um, releases of individual chemicals. I mean, IPEN made a study in Czech Republic around. A PVC recycling plant. And in that plant, they also found, let's say, increased uh, PCB levels in eggs, where one option was that if the this PVC recycling plant have also recycled plastic from the last 50 years, uh, then maybe some PCBs could have been released from that plant. But there, let's say, the final proof uh, has not been uh, done yet. Uh, and I think uh, more studies in this respect uh, is needed. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah. Another question? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so another question we have is, do you think the voluntary phase out by manufacturers, um, as it is happening in USA for some chemicals after causing considerable damage, has scope to minimize the use of hazardous chemicals? <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, if if you reduce chemicals, then it also has an impact. Yeah, but uh, I mean, we have we have uh, 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 published in two thousand fifteen uh, um, a paper uh, where we which we called the, the lock in problem. And uh, so what we see is yes, uh, for example, for for DKBD, yes, there was a voluntary phase out. United States, uh, Europe, 
relatively early uh, for some uses or uh, also for P4 yeah, from the, let's say industrial countries use, but at the same time then uh, India or other developing countries then might start uh, production of these chemicals because they are high uh, performance chemicals uh, and patent uh, are, are finished. Yeah, So uh, this kind of voluntary phase out, let's say on global level, in my opinion, have, has not worked. Yeah, and this we have published uh, in, uh, in 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 a paper Funky et al. 2015 um, in uh sustainable chemistry and pharmacy yeah it, it was actually in the first uh, in the first uh sh journal yeah of this this one so recommend to to read that one yeah other question yes thank you um so uh you have shown several studies about indoor exposure mainly household and school environments uh do you know if there are similar studies on exposure assessment for waste managers hmm. I mean, for for waste managers, uh, our working group uh, Hagenmeier, uh, yes, they did exposure studies uh, in respect to to fly ash. Yeah, so for sure, for fly ash, there there has been done a, a range of studies. I know one study. I think it's also in 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 Germany for some chemicals they have measured indoor exposure uh, in recycling plants and concluded at least for some chemicals. Uh, that uh, the exposure for these chemicals were not uh, exceeding tolerable uh, daily intake. I, I have looked when I uh, developed that uh, uh, um, report uh, into this topic of plastic additives and exposure, occupational exposure. And one major gap I found is that for most of the plastic additives, there is no uh, a limit uh, for working exposure, yeah, you have that. You have it for PCBs. You have it for dioxins. You have it for certain chemicals. But I think, for example, for all brominated flame retardants, there is no uh, limit for, for for worker exposure. Yeah, and certainly there there is exposure. Yeah, there is not. So we had uh, thirty years ago or forty years ago, even from BASF studies on 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 brominated dioxins uh, for uh, um, for workers. Um, at that time uh, in, 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 in production, yeah, but I think this is a huge gap, yeah. It's a huge gap for recyclers. It is a huge gap for uh, users, developing countries, uh, recycling this kind of plastic and remolding it. But I think also even for the, the production of plastic, yeah, even in industrial countries, I would see it as a gap because we do not have workplace limits uh, for most of the additives. Thank you. Um, and we have another question. What do you think should be the right approach when designing a plastic product to avoid chemicals of concern? Um, and then screening tests as an option? Um, now, I I mean, I, yeah, I was in a, in a project uh, for eco label in European Union. And at that time, you know, if you have, you have uh, OEM manufacturers and there you have uh, tools uh, to assess uh, chemicals, yeah. So you, you have uh, like GHS and CLP, so you know hazardous properties of chemicals, then you know chemicals of concern in your product, so this you can screen. And when you then substitute them, there are tools uh, for substitution where you evaluate chemical and let's say these kind of tools uh, you, can, you can use uh, that you um, avoid at least for those chemicals where hazard is known. What we have found in our study is that from these 13,000 chemicals, only for 6,000, I think uh, there was actually a, a hazard uh, assessment, yeah? But that for 50% of the chemical, the, the hazard assessment uh, was missing, yeah? So therefore there we have a big gap, yeah? So yes, of course you can do, you can do and there are methods and uh, let's say industry is doing that, but uh, because we have uh, still a, a big gap in the assessment of chemicals, yeah, there is, let's say, a kind of limit. So we need more assessment of all chemicals in the world that this kind of, uh, uh, also for the producers, and let's say that the whole chain, uh, or, um, production chain uh, can, can do uh, informed decision when they substitute hazardous chemicals in their plastic production. 
Thank you. Um, another question is, is total recycling of plastic waste possible and how well can we reduce ocean plastic? <laughs> no, uh, total recycling of plastic, yeah, for sure not as the moment as, as, as we have it. Yeah, like at the moment we have a, a yeah 10% maybe uh, recycled. Uh, there are different reasons for that. Um, one thing is, yes, I, I showed in the beginning uh, thermosets and thermoplastics. So thermosets cannot be recycled. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, for example, they can resource recovery um, or possibly chemical recycling. Uh, a big discussion. Um, so this is one thing what, what hinders. Yeah. But also when you do recycling, um, the quality of the recycled plastic, when we, for example, look to polyethylene and polypropylene, it will not reach a virgin material. So one problem is from polyethylene, polypropylene afterwards to really produce films, you know, packaging films uh, is, is very difficult. Yeah. So therefore, and, and this is 40% of all plastic, right? And uh, of course, they could be recycled maybe to benches or <clears throat> flower pots, but this is downcycling. Uh, so therefore, by this, you know, you cannot reach uh, real high, high recycling rates. Um, so therefore, yes, we need uh, two, two things. I mean, we really need to change plastic economy. <laughs> Industry knows, and I, uh, also European Union is going for that. Uh, and we need to improve uh, 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 the recycling. Yeah, But uh, no, we will not uh, reach 100% uh, recycling quota. And uh, I am not sure... Uh, how long it will take that we reach uh, 20, 30 percent recycling. Um, yeah, I hope as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, and a question on degradation. So degradation of plastics and release of additives is probably interconnected. What are relevant endpoints for measuring plastic degradation? Um, so any comments on that? <laughs> yeah, and actually I needed to, to make an addition. Uh, to my first question with the degradation, because when you look to polyethylene or polypropylene, yeah, um, so you you have also degradation of of the of the of the polymers, yeah. This means the polymer chains become shorter over years. So I have here a very interesting example. Um, I'm here in, in my father's house, and uh, every year we are harvesting berries. And last year we we harvested berries and and. <laughs> I, 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 I took a, a pot which we used also 30, 40 years ago. And when I put my my thumb on it, the plastic broke. So from outside, uh, the, the bucket did not look differently, but it, it, it shows that over these 30 years or 40 years, yeah, this bucket uh, really became, became brittle. Therefore, uh, when, and now we come to the question of degradation. So you see with my example of the bucket, you, you see we have to think about uh, uh, decades and even centuries. Yeah, And I mean, uh, we, we know that the plastic uh, in the ocean yeah, finally will degrade further and further um, from macro to micro to, 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 to nano. Yeah, and uh, huge research is, is ongoing on this. Yeah, so I am not involved uh, in, in that one, but I am quite curious on the, on the outcome. So there are maybe uh, better people uh, to um, give an, a further answer on that. Yeah, but this is, let's say, research in progress. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and kind of a combination of a few different questions. So regulations often lead to new chemical alternatives. So how can we avoid regrettable substitutions? Yeah, I mean, also there I can can uh, recommend you uh, our paper, FANCAT 2015 in Sustainable Chemistry and Pharmacy. Yeah, I mean, one thing is that we should not make incremental substitution. This means that we really should, should look maybe out of the box and, 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 and into different groups. Because when we look, for example, uh, for PFOS and P4, they mainly have been substituting with other uh, PFAS or prominated flame retardants like uh, decapromodiphenyl ether has uh, been substituted with other aromatic prominated flame retardants. So I think uh, one important thing is to really look uh, for uh, alternative chemistry. Yeah, um, possibly grouping chemicals and only allow essential uses for problematic chemicals like 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 PFAS, and also to look for material alternatives. Yeah, in addition to to chemical alternatives. Yeah, and then to really do a, a life cycle assessment for the different chemicals. Yeah, not to shift, let's say, 
um, to, to, to other drawbacks, yeah, coming from toxicity, but maybe afterwards the other chemical might have a very high other uh, ecological footprint, yeah. So also here for this, I can recommend Fanke et al. 2015, yeah. Thank you. Um, and another question, in most developing countries, the environmental limit of emission of hazardous waste is outdated as the limit of 1990s in use. Is there a way to encourage towards a review of emission limits? Uh, emission limits for what? Hazardous waste. So this may be related to plastics, may be related to other hazardous chemicals. Repeat one time the question. Um, in most developing countries, the environmental limit of emission of hazardous waste is outdated. Um, and is there a way to encourage towards a review of emission limits? Yeah, I think the question is a bit awkward. Yeah. I mean, uh, normally you have emission limits, for example, for incinerators. Yeah, so with the Stockholm Convention, uh, of course, uh, let's say uh, developing countries have started uh, to set uh, for some of the, let's say, industrial facilities emission limits. Um, well, but of course, there's a problem in implementation. There's a problem in uh, a measurement. When we go to PFAS, I do not see uh, that, that that we have already regulatory limits uh, in developing countries um, from from facilities. So yes, much has to be in, uh, done there. But also there, I see let's say that this, these global conventions can. Uh, bring a first impulse, but that we need, of course, uh, to look to many more chemicals, not only those which are listed, for example, in the Stockholm Convention. Thank you. Yes. Um, and one more question. So um, in many developing countries, we see the presence of a lot of recycling facilities. And how do we uh, protect the environment and the people working at these recycling facilities in developing countries specifically? Yeah, I mean, uh, also there, we, I mean, we can at least start with the Stockholm Convention. Yeah, because I mean, we have a big informal recycling and informal recycling, you really hardly has any, uh, let's say, support in respect to occupational exposure. We see that some countries uh, like China, for example, they have really changed a big part of the informal recycling to formal recycling and then really, let's say, reduced uh, this kind of exposure. And this has happened by in several countries. I would also say uh, Thailand. Yeah. So I think these kind of countries, they could take can be taken as a role model. Yeah, and then they should be used in, in, in other developing countries. But that's a very long process. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have the Stockholm Convention where at least, let's say, for electronic waste uh, and waste plastic yeah, activities, we have in Africa already projects. Yeah, this can be, let's say, pr promoted, uh, but uh, that's uh, for sure a long way uh, to go. Thank you. And just another question on health effects. So um, a lot of the research was based around the health effects on males um, and the participant is wondering if there's any studies on females and um, any comments on that. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole uh, endocrine disrupting chem uh, chemical uh, has uh, started with, with the female uh, uh, hormones. And, and of course, I mean, uh, females and especially then uh, pregnant women are especially vulnerable uh, to these uh, additives. Um, so uh, therefore, I mean, all what I showed for children effects yeah, uh, the neurodevelopmental effects of children and so on. I mean, that's all uh, relevant uh, for, for for women and 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 fetus. Yeah, I just uh, choose uh, this sperm quality because this cotton cum study is so good. Yeah, but there are uh, huge amounts of of studies um, on different uh, hormone effects uh, in respect to females. But when we look to the to the total fertility, uh, we see this decrease in fertility. We mainly see in the in in in, in the males. Yeah. So for the females, there is a, a review article on 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 uh, on fertility, uh, which concludes that there is not a real decrease in fertility for for females. Yeah. But here, you know, we are very much worrying uh, on the impact to the fetus. And also for breastfeeding, then uh, to the child uh, in in this uh, very sensitive uh, time of development. 
Thank you. And uh, just a question on the circular economy. So can we uh, solve using circular economy the um, issues related to plastics? Um, could you just comment more on that? Mm -hmm. no, but I think, you know, also when we think about the time, yeah, I think I, I showed before, yeah, with this recyclability, yeah, that we cannot uh, solve uh, all, all, all problems. Um, and uh, yeah, that we, I mean, the first start is anyway, uh, a big waste management uh, improvement uh, in developing countries uh, before we can talk about uh, a circular economy. Uh, and we will see how far we come uh, at the moment. I do not see where, where, where do we get the money for that. In developing countries, you have a few dollars per ton. With this, uh, you cannot start recycling. You need much, much more money for that. So here, I really hope also for the plastic treaty that uh, something on global scale can be can be changed before we can talk or think about uh, global and, and and circular economy yeah long way long way to go yeah thank maybe, you maybe one more question now and then we make maybe a 5 minutes break huh? and uh, then Sure. Yes. Uh, okay. So one more question. Um, could you touch on risk assessment in seawater and how can we measure um, many of these toxins? Risk assessment. Okay. See what I mean then. Okay. For the people which are swimming now, mainly for, for the fishes, of course. Um, ah, no, I think uh, there you, you better Google. Yeah. Uh, and 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 look for for research groups which are really uh, looking into this uh, let's say uh, pollutant concentrations in water. Um, I mean, this is then that's one exposure pathway of those which are diluted. Yeah, but then we have all the plastic with the additives. Yeah, so let's say this is a it seems a quite a, a complicated issue where you need to include also the plastics in the water and the chemicals in plastics in the water uh, and, and, and combine this study. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. But you know, I, at, the meme, at the moment, I, all, all industrial countries are, are doing uh, big studies. I think uh, these kind of really complex uh, research questions, uh, this should be also somehow uh, yes, harmonized and, and, and looked at. I mean, who is looking at, 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 at what, yeah? Uh, so I have not seen a study on this, but you know, so much uh, publications are coming up. There might be something out. Great, thank you so much for all your great responses. Um... In biota pollution, and I'm happy that uh, you, Shige, give us some insights on this uh, uh, topic of today. Uh, you also would be much better than maybe uh, if you want uh, after your presentation give an answer on this uh, pollution of the of the marine uh, uh, water, if you want to add something. So the title of the talk is Plastic Mediated Long Range Transport of Additives in Marine Environments and their Bioaccumulation Through Plastic Ingestion. Yeah, so please, uh, Professor Takada, please, Shige, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. And thank you, Roland, for your kind introduction. Especially the thank you so much for your very comprehensive review of the attitudes. And thank you so much for your providing the, this this opportunity to present some of our research related to chemicals in plastics. So, let me start with acknowledgement to the staff and the students. In the oh, sorry. Can you hear? Let me start yes, with. Yes. Yeah, we yeah, be here. Yeah, yeah, you can start. Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, very well. Yeah. Let me start with the acknowledgement to the students and the staff in our laboratory and volunteers for IPW and ITEM. They have have provided precious sample data and precious discussions. Thank you. And my talk today covers the criteria of chemicals for Stockholm Convention, that is long range transport and bioaccumulation. Let me start with the first topic that is long range transport of ventriazole 
by your stabilizers. Labs with millimeter size microplastics. We've been analyzing PE polyethylene pellets for our monitoring of pops. However, this time we have yeah, plastic additives in polypropylene pellets to provide um, evidence of long range transport of additives via millimeter size plastics. Plastic regime pellets are feed stock of plastic final products. Plastics are synthesized from petroleum at the four pellets. Pellets are transported to factories where they are put into molds, heated and placed to be final plastic products. During handling and transport, a portion of the pellets are spilled to the environment. When rain comes, they are washed to streams and rivers to find their way to the ocean. Because they are non biodegradable and floatable, they are distributed across the globe. We can find pellets on beaches all over the world. Because of their hydrophobic nature, they efficiently absorb hydrophobic chemicals, including pops from surrounding seawater. We have been conducting international pellet watch since 2005. We call for to collect pellets on the nearby beaches and send them to our laboratory in Tokyo. We analyze pops in pellets from various locations in the world. So far, we focused on pops absorbed from surrounding seawater and provided monitoring data on soap pops, such as PCBs in coastal zones. This is an example that is concentrated of PCBs in pellets. We always analyze five pools of, for each location. Though concentrations of PCBs in the five pools are normally highly variable among, among the pools, but when we take median concentration, they reflect hops concentration in seawater. This map shows median concentration of PCBs of five foods in the world beaches. In any way, we have been focusing on chemicals sold from seawater. However, this time, we have analyzed some a kind of additives that is the diazole type UV stabilizer like this. We analyzed 10 sorts of the bugs, the PT pellets. Normally additives are compounded when plastic products are manufactured from pellets to the final products. Therefore, we don't see additives in most of virgin pellets. However, high concentrations of additives are compound into master batch pellets. And we may find additives even in pellets. In addition, recycled pellets contain, may contain plastic additives. PP polypropylene is less resistant to weathering 
therefore they require much more UV stabilizer. Thus, the first study focus on PP pellets together with polyethylene PE pellets. So uh, we have analyzed PE pellets for monitoring of pups in seawater due to their more assortive nature of the hydrophobic chemicals. We analyzed pellets this time from 37 pellet samples collected from beaches across the world. The pellets were sorted into P, P, P and PE by using near infrared spectrometer. We analyzed PP pellets. Each sample consists of 25 to 50 pieces of pellets. PP pellets were extracted with HCN and acetylated, and acetylated bulbs were purified by using silica gel column chromatography and analyzed by GCMS. Here we have analytical data on bulbs, then triazole type UV stabilizer in it, Poly polypropylene pellet, concentration of some of 10 bulbs as shown as height of pink bar. Concentration bulbs are very much better from a few nanogram per gram pellets to more than 70,000 nanogram per gram. Among 37 samples, 14 samples showed higher concentration of higher concentrations above 4,000 nanogram per gram. The 14 locations include remote islands, such as Makori Island, Hawaii, Ogawara, Hachijo Island. We will dis discuss about the sources of bubs in the next few slides. Bubs in marine environment comes from sorption from seawater in addition to master batch pellets and recycled pellets. However, relatively low concentrations of PCBs were observed in pellets from the island, such as Makol, Hawaii, Ogasawara, and Hachijo Islands. But we found much high concentrations of bubbles in remote islands. This means these have High concentration of bugs in these remote islands are uh, not from sorption from seawater, but additives compounded to resin pellets or recycled pellets. To explore the possibility of sorption, we have utilized data on bubs in PE polyethylene pellets from Carlson et al. Because PE is more assortive than PP, and PE has less chance of having bubs because of more resistance to weathering. Total bubs concentration in PE pellets are uh, also variable among the locations, but the maximum concentration of bubs in the pellet were 4,000 nanogram per gram. Thus, we consider 4,000 nanogram per gram 
as a potential maximum concentration of sorption derived bubbles. When we applied this right threshold concentration for thousand nanogram, we concluded that bubbles from these 14 locations, these uh, the concentrations are above 4,000 per gram. These four locations, bubbles from these 14 locations are derived not from option, but from master batch or recycled parents. The 14 locations include remote island such as Makori and Hawaii and Ogasawara and Hachijo Islands. Furthermore, bubbles concentrations in the four remote islands were comparable to those observed in the coastal locations, urban areas. This provides the evidence of long-range transport of bugs from the urban area to the remote locations for hundreds or thousands of kilometers without drastic bleaching or without drastic degradation. This is a strong evidence of long-range transport of the, the bugs from the remote urban area to remote islands for hundreds to thousand kilometers. When we conducted similar comparison between PP pellets with PE pellets on compound specific approach, it is indicated that additive derived bubbles were normally UB326 and UB327 with minor but significant contribution from UB329 and UB328. These additives are hydrophobic and they are retained in and similar size of microplastic fragments in marine environments. So far, I have introduced data on plastic mediated long range transport of hydrophobic additives in marine environments. Let me move on to the second topic that is microplastic mediated bioaccumulation of plastic additives. Plastic retain hydrophobic additives and organisms ingest plastics. This is a kind of internal exposure of additives to the organisms. Key question was transfer and accumulation of these additives from ingested plastics to the tissue of marine organisms. Because additives are compounded or trapped in polymer grids and were thought to be difficult to be reached out of plastics. So it was thought that the plastic additives are inert in plastics. However, oily in digestive fluid facilitates the reaching of the hydrophobic additives. And also the surfactant may facilitate the reaching of hydrophobic additives from plastics. Furthermore, fragmentation of plastic breaks polymer chain and decreases the ability of trap additives in microplastics. State. So we have studied these processes and reveals that the additives in plastics are not in through 
laboratory experiments and field observations, as shown in the following few slides. So reaching and bioaccumulation of additives will be different among compounds depending on hydrophobicity. We utilized two BFRs, that is PD209 and BBDPE. Both are highly hydrophobic. We also utilized four UV stabilizers, UV326, UV327, UV328, and UV234. These are moderately hydrophobic. Let me start with facilitated leaching by oily components in digested, digested fluids of seabirds. Through leaching experiments by using the several the sol solution, we demonstrated that oily components such as fish oil and stomach oil from seabed in digested fluid accelerated the reaching of hydrophobic additives. This mechanism was confirmed by two independent research groups. We found the transfer and accumulation of hydrophobic additives by semi-field exposure experiment by using seabirds to which plastic regime pellets with additives were fed. To understand the spread and magnitude of the transfer and accumulation of additives from ingested plastic to seabirds tissue, we collected and analyzed green ground oil from seabirds. We measured plastic additives in spring ground oil samples from 145 individuals of 31 species from 16 locations in the world. Among 145 individuals, 60 seabirds contained bench triazole type UV stabilizers, significant level. This means that about 40% of that accumulated the plastic additive. Some accumulate additives directly from ingested plastics, and some others accumulate the additive through their natural play, play, which concentrates the additives reached from plastics. Interesting point example is that high concentration of UB328 was detected in great shear water and petroleum from Gulf Island and Marion Island, both are remote and desert islands. Actually, great shear water and blue petrel are species with highest incidence of plastic ingestion in this area of the ocean. Most probably, the UV stabilizers came directly from ingestion, ingested plastics like this. Let me show you another example of transfer of additives from ingested plastics to the organism on remote islands. We studied hermit crab on sandy beach in Okinawa, Japan. We have very clean beach like this. On the same island, there is a beach with huge amounts of plastic stranded to 
wind direction and wind sea currents. We collected amid club on the contaminated beach and control beach. First, we measured microplastics in digestive tract of the hermit club by using micro FTIR. The hermit club contained microplastics, including polystyrene in the digestive tract. As a microplast, hermit club on plastic contaminated beach contain two orders of magnitude higher of microplastic than those from Green Beach. We also measured plastic additives in the tissue of habit club. In five habit club individuals from plastic contaminated beach contain Higher concentration of brominated cream retardant, such as BD209 yeah, and BD179 in hepatopancreas, while only trace concentrations of such additives were detected for those from control beach. This again indicates that. Plastic bring these chemicals to the organism. Furthermore, it was suggested that the accumulated chemicals are metabolized in the organism. Because ED209 was the parent additive, but it was, we found much more dominated congenites. This means the metabolization occurred in the biological system of the, of the Hamid club. We confirmed the transfer of plastic additives and their met metabolization in Hamid club by using exposure experiments. The detection of these metabolites of, of BD209 on the laboratory exposure experiments, it, that the BD209 was bioaccumulated by the club and metabolized in the body. So the detection of these metabolites of BD209 is another indicator of the significance of plastic mediated exercise. We studied another pox that is HBCD this in the same species of hermit club on the same remote island. This time we measured HBCDs in microplastic in digestive tract. After we measured, we identified these very tiny microplastics by micro FTIR. Because HBCDs were common additives for polystyrene, especially the expanded polystyrene before the international and national regulation. This graph shows polystyrene in digestive tracts of having the club in plastic connected beaches and beaches with less plastics. The orange color indicates the location of the plastic contaminated beaches and blue color's location indicates less plastic contaminated beaches. Digest the truck of having the club from plastic contaminated beach had high amount of polystyrene in the digestive tract like this, like this. For the individuals with higher abundance of polystyrene, 
in the digest state tract, higher amounts of higher concentration of HBCDs were detected in hepatopancreas in the individual. This also, the, we detected the HBCDs in the microplastics from digestive tract for these individuals. So this consistent detection of polystyrene and HBCDs can be ascribed to microplastic native bioaccumulation of the additives. So far, I have talked about direct bioaccumulation of additives from ingested plastic to biological tissue. However, we have considered another process that is indirect bioconcentration. In such mechanism, hydrophobic additives are reached out to seawater and and the organisms concentrate the least additives from seawater. We also conduct, conducted laboratory exposure experiments by using cell and fine polyethylene fragment, plastic fragment, ranging from 125 to 250 microns containing UV stabilizers and BD209 BD and BD DPE. We observed accumulation of bugs in the gonads of muscle, whereas no accumulation was observed for BRs. This difference suggests that bioaccumulation of additives is controlled by hydrophobic chemicals. Moderately hydrophobic additives are more easy to be reached out of plastics to digest the fluid to be bioaccumulated into the tissue of muscles. On the other hand, High hydrophobic additives are difficult to be reached out of plastics and no bioaccumulation was observed under this condition of experiments. We have assessed this process more in separate experiments. Stainless steel mesh was used to prevent direct contact of microplastics to but allow reaching of additives for UV3297 significantly increased. But observed compared to control here, indicating that indirect exposure occurred. But on the other hand, no bioaccumulation, bi bioaccumulation was observed for BD209. However, when we utilized surfactant, increased tissue concentration of both compounds were observed, indicating that bioaccumulation through indirect exposure was observed for UV329, sorry, UV321, and even for BD209. It was also obvious that the surfactant facilitates bioaccumulation of hydrophobic additives. Furthermore, when stainless steel mesh was removed to allow ingestion of microplastic by muscle under the presence of surfactants, bioaccumulation of additives were facilitated for UV327, even BD209. Based on laboratory experiments using muscles, we suggest that following mechanism for moderately hydrophobic additives such as bugs 
indirect concentration is important where additives are reached out of microplastics and bioconcentrated to the tissue of aquatic organisms. For the highly hydrophobic chemicals, additives such as BB209, bioaccumulation of the additives from ingested plastics are more important. Both processes are facilitated by the presence of substance. These mechanisms were confirmed by another exposure experiment by using prey predator system consisting of mice on the fish. Microplastics with around 30 micron com compounded with DFR and bugs were exposed to mice and mice were exposed to the fish. In this system, the additives uh, were directly and internally exposed to the ingested plastic to the fish. In addition, microplastics were exposed to the fish. In this system, the additives were reached out to water and exposed to the fish prior. Muscle and livers were taken by digestion and analyzed for the additives. BD09 and BDDP were accumulated only in the mus muscle tissue via play and not via water. On the other hand, UB234 and UB327 were accumulated in liver, both play and fire water. These results can be explained by the same mechanism where highly high the positives are bioaccumulated in muscle tissue directly from ingested microplastics. On the other hand, moderately hydrophobic additives are once leached out to water and indirectly concentrated in liver. So in conclusion, in conclusion, regarding long-range transport, analysis of pellet demonstrated that millimeter size plastic transport bubbles for hundreds of hundreds to thousand kilometers without drastic degradation or drastic leaching regarding bioaccumulation of active in plastics. Laboratory exp exposure experiment and field observations indicated that hydrophobic additives are not enough, not trapped in plastic and can be bioaccumulated. Fragmentation, breaking down microplastics and with oily digestive fluid and reaching with surfactants facilitate bioaccumulation of additives. For highly hydrophobic additives such as BD209, direct accumulation from ingested plastic would be more important. For more Active, such as BD, such as UB328 and UB327, reaching to water and via concentration of water could be important too. Microplastic with additives can be excreted from biota, liquid leaching, and contribution of the plastic mediated by bioaccumulation of single ingestion to be minor compared to the, to the total exposure of additives. However, microplastics are not biodegradable and easy to be resuspended due to their low density close to the water and can be repeatedly ingested by bio until the barrier. Long-term long and repeated exposure of additives to marine organisms and finally to the human to be larger than that those we estimated based on single total exposure of active to human should be assessed by measure of active in all the potential sources and understanding of individual processes. 
On the other hand, various classic attitudes are detected in human beings, and some symptoms of endocrine disrupting have been already detected. As a precautionary approach, reduction of plastic usage has been recommended. This conclusion has been incorporated into the review paper from Mindelu Monaco Commission. I have been involved, involved in this paper. We made similar conclusion and also similar recommendation. Okay. Again, I'd like to acknowledge to the staff and students. Thank you so much for your attention. That's all my talk. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Shige. Thank you very much, Professor Takada. It's unbelievable how detailed your studies are. Um, I mean, for the long range transport, you know, you gave with your studies a very important uh, input uh, to the discussion in the pop reviewing committee about the listing of UV uh, 328 on, on the long range transport. Yeah, so that study is is is, is very important at the moment. Uh, I think a guidance is developed, and uh, also uh, your studies on this exposure um, directly from the plastic, the additives to the individual uh, animals uh, is 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 really super and is astonishing. I mean, I, I saw your plenary lecture in two thousand nineteen at, at the Kyoto Dioxin Conference. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah, for your for your studies and for giving us this overview on uh, environmental uh, pollution in the marine environment and exposure to additives uh, in, in in plastic. Um, we come now before and later on we do a, a Q and A session. Yeah, so but uh, uh, first we will uh, now look uh, to the presentation of the next presenter. And the next uh, speaker is uh, Mrs. Yuyun Ismavati. She's from the International Pollutant, formerly POPS Elimination Network. So that's a global NGO network on chemical pollution. And also uh, she's a member of Nexus 3, which is an Indonesian uh, NGO working on uh, pollution topics, including terrestrial plastic pollution. So Yuyun uh, will talk about Pops in plastic, contamination of the terrestrial environment and the food chain. Yeah, Yu Yun, uh, the floor is yours and you can share your presentation and unmute your microphone. Yeah, you, you, you need to unmute your microphone. Yes, thank you, Roland. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I would like to share um, our research studies conducted by many participating organizations of IPEN in various countries and led by our colleagues in Czech Republic Arnik from Arnica Association. Um, I hope I do justice in delivering this presentation. Um, thank you for asking me um, to share uh, our works and contribute to this conference. Uh, can you see my presentation here? Yes. Yes, yes, we see okay. your slide and now, yes, and now you are in presentation mode. Okay. So please, yes, we are looking forward. Yeah, you, you. Thank you, Roland. Um, um, my organization is Nexus 3 Foundation, and I work as the senior advisor and the co-founder of the organization. Uh, we work with various organizations and especially affiliated to IPEN, International Pollutant Elimination Network. And I'm not working for IPEN, but I'm the steering committee member of IPEN and advisor. Um, I would like to um, acknowledge this uh, presentation also and studies supported by various donors and various organizations. And especially um, thank you to Roland and Dr. Peter Benish uh, from BDS that uh, we, were collab we collaborated a lot uh, when we conducting these studies. As um, Roland already presented at the beginning of this uh, webinar, there are more than 13,000 uh, of chemicals that use um, for uh, plastic additives. And also um, some of them are only assessed uh, of their hazard, uh, hazardous um, potential and risk. 
and further studies can be done, can be seen also in the new report uh, just released uh, recently by the BRS uh, about the global governance of plastics and associated chemicals. Um, this is also already explained in details by um, Roland earlier. I will not explain too much here, but I would like to highlight that the global plastic market the additives, um, the additives market are increasing over the years. And um, if in 2020, they sold already 57.8 billion tons, uh, billion um, dollars, I guess, this is uh, 17 uh, kilotons. Um, with the increased productions of uh, projection of plastics until 2050, for sure, these chemicals, additive uh, sales also will be increased. Um, so Roland already explained a little bit about the circular economy and how toxic it is if we do not uh, read off the um, POPs chemicals in plastics products. Um, I cannot emphasize enough that plastics is actually carbon plus chemicals. So it's um, the basic or the raw materials are coming from fossil fuel. So this is strongly correlated with uh, climate change. And then uh, during the productions, a lot of um, chemicals produce and use. Uh, to make plastics and other products, of course. Um, and once the products are ready to be um, distributed in the market, it will be used by consumers. Um, and one of the examples that are already highlighted by Roland is the toys and building materials that use a lot of plastics and especially um, with uh, harmful additives. And when consumers finish their um, to use using their products, it will be uh, separated and then collected as um, by by waste collectors, and in a proper recycling plant, you will see the picture like here um, sorted in a um, they call it a material recovery facility with uh, mechanicals and a lot of fancy equipments to separate the waste. And then um, it will be shipped. Um, most of them will be shipped to uh, developing countries because the recycling capacity of the developing country, the developed countries are limited. For instance, in Europe, they could only re recycle 20% or 40% maximum of plastic recycling. That's why many developed countries exporting um, the plastic waste to developing countries like my country, Indonesia. And um, with, the, with the intention to be recycled. However, we found underground that many of these plastic waste that being exported, not really 100% recycled. And uh, as you see in, on top here um, with the smokes, uh, this is not the, this is a not factory lines, but this is tofu production lines, and it's a home industry in one of the villages in in East Jaffa. And then uh, they they use. I will explain later about that. And uh, when the the unwanted plastic waste um, discarded by the importers and also the communities, it will be dumped on the ground. And then um, this will further contaminating the soil and then the food chain. Um, so um, Professor Takada also already gave um, a very comprehensive explanations. I love your presentation, Professor Takada. Thank you so much uh, from uh, the uh, big sphere of ocean and water and then goes into um, species. Um, that is remarkable. Um, uh, I just want to highlight that the plastics that release to the environment also broken down into microplastics and nanoplastics. Uh, and this is coming from various sources as explained before by uh, many speakers, um, but also a lot of um, microplastics in the environment are coming from uh, tires, um, transportation, so many uh, particles on the roads are also coming from vehicles or tires especially, and then in many 
developed countries um, from wastewater treatment plants because the sludge also containing a lot of uh, particles and, and fibers and microplastics from uh, laundry and then from sewage uh, treatment plant. Uh, and also some landfills uh, will also have uh, and release uh, microplastics through the air and also into the groundwater. Um, so uh, both Pro Professor Takada and um, Roland already gave the perspectives um, at the beginning that plastics are slow, uh, slowly degraded into the environment. But with all these chemicals additives um, found in plastic waste and in plastic products, and its impact to human health, especially um, human reproductive health, this will be a threat to um, humanity. So it will create a long-term humanity problem. Um, so different sizes will affect differently. I saw a question about the impact of microplastics to uh, health, uh, but there's also a big unknown impact of nanoplastics because when they come into different sizes, the, the, the substances or the materials could behave differently. Um, and also um, um, UV 328 already mentioned earlier. So that's uh, being used um, to make plastics um, uh, less prone to uh, sunlight and less brittle. Um, but um, the study shows also that um, the degradation rate of plastics in the marine environment um, it's um it's 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 remarkable actually and then when we com compare it this is not about the competitions of the pollutions in the ocean and our soil or terrestrial but uh, this is a, a wake up call for everyone that if we compare how far how long the plastic pollutions will be lasted in the environment and will be around us this is a, a, a scary and and should be um, considered as a, an emergency alert. Um, study shows that the degradation of major plastics category one until six, especially, they are slower uh, degraded in the environment compared to um, microplastics in the marine environment. Um, and this is resulting in more accumulation in the soil, especially in agriculture uh, sector when they use plastics. And then in the sewer lines, in sewerage treatment plants and so on. And then the pops of uh, chemicals, additives and plastics also uh, migrate over time to soil and uh, which eventually also absorbed by plants, which uh, we have a few information about that and more research needed to see how far uh, this will be affecting um, uh, us, especially as, as, the, as the main uh, occupant of this planet. Um, and plastic dump sites also leads to massive terrestrial uh, pollution. And this picture, taken um, in one of the locations of plastic dump sites in Malaysia um, as a result of dumping uh, of the unwanted plastic waste uh, to be supposed to be uh, to be recycled but because of various reasons and then sometimes illegal or smuggler also um, using the channel of plastic waste that um, these unwanted plastic waste ended up in, in community land, in empty space and so on, and eventually it, it will be burned. Um, so due to widespread presence of um, the pollutions of plastics and environmental and the, the environmental persistence of, of the plastic additives, um, microplastic pollutions, um, Consider, has been considered as the, as the uh, threat uh, to uh, the terrestrial ecosystem. Uh, but we need more research to be done and more, there are still a lot of unknown uh, information, um, how 
plants taking up the pollutions, how the soil survive, you know, not only from the plastic pollutions, but also from other chemicals, uh, for instance, pesticides. Um, I explained earlier that the recycling um, industry after China uh, closed the door to import mixed waste uh, has been flooded and, and shifted to Southeast Asian countries and Africa. And these are the situations that we could find on the ground where we see a lot of um, unwanted plastic scrap being burned because some communities do not want it and recyclers do not want it. And the, 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 the producer in the developed countries also do not want it. So um, the environment have to suffer and, and accept this, this situation. And um, this guy uh, in blue, he's one of the community that uh, one of the community members in East Java that um, trying to take advantage of plastic waste trade. Um, in the dumping site, uh, we found him scavenging metals, especially the one that bind the bales. Uh, for them, it's more valuable. So it's amazing that uh, on top of this huge uh, piles of unwanted plastic waste and papers, um, the scavengers or waste pickers are only interested in, in the metals. That's so sad. And um, IPEN just recently released a new report uh, highlighting um, the contaminants in, in waste trade, which are bigger and bigger than, than we thought before, because uh, many contaminants in, uh, in a waste trade are unknown and it's a mix. So um, there is no information about what kind of contaminants um, smuggled into or, or or, or bailed into the shipment and how we should deal with it because the Basel Amendment uh, only recommend countries to have trade um, with clean or homogeneous uh, commodities. Um, so these are one of uh, the studies conducted by uh, various uh, groups, um, including CL, Breakfree from Plastics, Gaia and, and everybody and everyone. Um, and then um, the I understand that the IPCP and UNEP conducted uh, the global uh, monitoring uh, plan in various countries, and I believe that this kind of uh, uh, visual um, also found in many countries in the study led by um, Dr. Roland Weber, and also these pictures um, taken from several sites conducted by IPEN and IPEN participating NGOs in various countries. I just want to highlight here that the situations in this picture came from Ghana uh, on top here, where elect electronic waste being burned and the and recyclers only interested in, in particular metals. And then down left here is the tofu factory where they use plastics like this on the right side bottom. Um, where they recycled <laughs> recycled as fuel um, and they burn um, um, shredded plastics, which was uh, the byproducts or unwanted uh, waste produced by paper recycling uh, industry. Because when they imported paper, a lot of plastic waste actually also uh, in the packaging. Um, so because they are paper recycling company, not paper recycling company. Um, they they dump uh, all these shredded uh, plastics um, and and donate it to the community um, as the community development uh, effort. And on top also um, e waste recycling uh, site in Thailand. And in the middle, that's our star. Um, unfortunately, um, our star where um, the chicken is running around in a um, um, dumping site. So these are the, uh, this is the simplify um, roots of exposure of pops um, to chicken eggs um, and especially to food chain, we call it because um, chicken is uh, very common um, um, to be um, 
you know, to keep the, in, in the house, at the back of the house um, in many places in, in Asia, in, in, in Africa. Um, chi raising chicken at home is the easy uh, farm uh, farming to do. And uh, chicken can eat anything on the ground and the soil, but um, the dust, as explained earlier also by the previous speakers, that dust, ashes, um, can distribute it through the environment and then uh, deposit it in some places and eventually it will be landed on the ground and if the chicken eat the food from the ground then there is a big potential of this chicken eating microplastics or or dust or or grains that contaminated already uh, by uh, pops chemicals uh, especially in plastic additives. Um, so why is it eggs, chicken eggs? Um, there are an increasing number of reports on contaminations of eggs uh, with uh, dioxins and dioxin like PCB in, in, in recent years. And um, in Netherlands, a study showed that um, POPs found more than 50% in eggs that was collected from a small uh, free range chicken holders. Um, and this is above uh, the EU limit. And then uh, eggs found also to be a sensitive indicator for PCB, um, sorry, for dioxins, furans, and PCB and other pops contaminant, uh, contamination in soils. And um, IPEN study since 2005 has been consistently um, using eggs as, as POPs indicators uh, that can be done easily in many places. Um, and free-range chickens also picked and ingesting foods uh, from the soil and dust in, uh, in the local area. So depending on the source of the pollution, uh, chicken can, um, can collect and ingest it um, um, Pops uh, contaminant and accumulated in their body, especially the hen. And because it's um, eggs high, a very significant, uh, have a very significant lipid content, it's accumulated in the eggs. And it's only the egg yolk, um, not the white. Um, and because it's an invasive uh, approach, um, although we have to ask the permissions of the uh, of the the mother hen that we are collecting some of their uh, eggs, um, chicken is uh, chicken eggs have found as the to be the insensitive indicators of pops, um, and um, in many places also these chicken eggs uh, has been consumed every day or daily. And this is considered as a good and affordable protein source for, for the communities. So if people continue eating um, chicken eggs contaminated by pops, especially by dioxins, this will um, also becoming risk to um, human health. And, <coughs> excuse me, from many studies that are conducted by IPEN in several countries, um, it's uh, the source of, of uh, contaminants also important to be highlighted and to be watched because um, for instance, with this example from Indonesia, it's the tofu factory that use it as fuel. As you can see in this picture, um, this is bales of plastics from uh, all over the world. I could some sometimes I could identify also the logos and uh, um, some of them are still intact, so we can see where they came from. Um, <clears throat> and after the burning, um, the the ashes uh, spread out uh, like the photo at the bottom um, in a cornfield. So the field on the left is uh, going to be used um, for corn field corn farm, um, but they use also some ashes um, as fertilizers, they call it, because the tofu makers have to rid off the ash and then it's located in um, uh, agriculture area. So they said this is a good use of the ash because it's a good fertilizer. So that's how the community use it. And then we compare the um, 
the concentrations of uh, eggs from collected from several sites um, in the study. And um, we, we look at the windrows and then the locations of the um, tofu uh, factories and the boilers. Um, and we decided to collect the samples in certain locations. And then when we raised this issue, um, uh, because before that we found out that the dioxin level is um, 60 to 600 times above the safe level, um, the, the Minister of Environment um, reacted and then they formed a task force to investigate further and collected more uh, samples um, to verify our study. Um, but the practice of using uh, plastic waste as the fuel has been um, um, informally uh, supported by uh, the government because that's um, the way of living. But after we release our report, uh, we recommended um, the factory, the paper factory, to provide uh, wood uh, or donate wood to the communities um, instead of uh, plastic waste. So that practice changed for a couple of months or a year or so. But then after that, the practice continues um, because um, lack of enforcement. Um, and also in other country, um, in Africa especially, um, um, electronic waste site has been also a um, source of uh, dioxin contaminants to um, local chicken eggs. And IPEN conducted studies in Ghana, Kenya, Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand for this, uh, looking at uh, chicken eggs collected from uh, nearby um, e-waste recycling sites. And the result shows that um, the dioxins and uh, PCB and PCB-like um, were between um, um, 20 to 856 picogram uh, TQ. And uh, therefore, this, all of these samples are um, uh, above the safe level, especially if we compare it with the EU regulatory uh, limits. Um, in Africa, um, the eggs collected from uh, e-waste collection, uh, e-waste dumping sites, had a TEQ level above 500 uh, uh, a picogram of the ET, um, TEQ uh, fat, uh, and this is more than 100 times uh, above the regulatory limit. Um, the eggs from a globo a global boshi actually actually um sorry that's a bit typo there um a global boshi in ghana uh, has the highest uh, concentration uh in the study and um that came from burning the cable uh, which is done um, frequently in the area because uh, recyclers are looking for copper, uh, which is usually found in, in uh, cables. Um, and um, this is leads to um, um, another, because this is all electronic uh, waste site, um, PBDEs and BFRs are also found uh, in the eggs. So back to the um, dioxins in chicken eggs uh, from several countries, when we compare it, um, again, Albu uh, came first in Ghana um, <laughs> because in e-waste, um, a lot of um, uh, um, uh, PVC used and also uh, softener or plasticizer. And if we compare to the EU um, uh, limit, um, that was uh, that is two, two, two and a half uh, picogram, uh, the WHO TQ, um, and uh, dioxin likes and PCB, sorry, PCDD or dioxins, uh, furans uh, plus dioxin like PCB is five um, picogram. When we compare it with uh, the national standards, we found out that in Indonesia, probably this is a mistake when um, the government set up this limit. It was the 
um, tighter than the EU standard. Um, probably this is a mistake when they established the standard, but um, we've raised this issue a couple of times. Uh, we are looking forward that uh, these regulations will be uh, uh, corrected or reviewed uh, soon. Um, another study conducted by uh, IPAN and, and also um, other, uh, um, other researchers uh, in Kazakhstan. Um, in Kazakhstan, um, the samples was collected near um, the car wreck, car wreck uh, dumping sites, and also near the cement kiln. And in that site, um, BFR found um, in in high concentration. So hexabromoacyclodetocane um, is partly used. Um, in a car as uh, frame retardants for uh, the um, dashboards and everything, and also um, expanded uh, polystyrene. So Kazakhstan is a country with cold winter and it's increasingly using insulation uh, for buildings and uh, they use uh, expanded uh, polystyrene. Um, so the results of um, uh, um, HBCDD from um, Kazakhstan and Thailand shows very high concentrations. Um, and then also if we compare it with the second egg, which is supposed to be the control, but it has high concentration. So Kazakhstan's uh, soil and air probably already contaminated. Um, before we collected the samples, but all activities and industrial activities around that area um, for sure contributed to the accumulation of POPs. And then in Thailand, um, the pool eggs uh, that collected is lower than uh, the detection limit, um, but probably they have uh, higher concentrations in different, uh, different chemicals. So the conclusion is that um, large pollution of the terrestrial environment uh, with plastic and microplastics um, much higher than the marine uh, microplastics pollution four to th th 23 times higher. But once again, this is not com competition between the plastic um, pollutions in the environment, um, especially the ocean versus um, terrestrial. But this is, should be our concern and um, policy and regulations also have to be um, tightened um, so it will protect especially the food chain. Um, the open burning of uh, electronic waste um, um, containing plastics and um, which resulted in high dioxin pollution in soils because it's getting burned and it was left there on the site um, over the years. Um, it could contaminate uh, chicken and eggs um, because it's um, it's accumulating in the environment and it could result in the extreme high dioxin levels. Um, using plastic as fuel is a non BAT. It's a not a best practices, not best available techniques of um, incinerator, um, like use in tofu boilers or lime kilns. Um, uh, it will contaminate the environment with high levels of dioxins. Um, and in particular, when the ash has been mismanaged, like uh, I explained earlier. Um, the plastics and polymer forms containing um, POPs additives like uh, SPCD and PPDE results in a uh, high contamination of um, uh, POPs in, in chicken eggs. And um, we've seen also underground a lot of uh, chicken picking the expanded uh, polystyrene because it's, it's foamy and it's probably easy to chuck. Um, so this, uh, we should prevent that from happening. Um, but with an increased threats of plastic uh, pollution in the environment and food chain, um, capacity building for local researchers are very important. And also laboratories capacities, especially in developing countries, 
uh, are needed to support um, evidence-based policy and the control of contamination from POPs uh, contamination of food, contaminating our food chain. Um, thank you so much for uh, listening. Looking forward to have um, a question and answer. And if you have questions, you can also email me or Dr. Rohan Weber and our colleague Jean Drick uh, from Arnica. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Yunyun. Also for this impressive presentation, I mean that we really see and understand what happens in developing countries with uh, the plastic we we partly export yeah, to your countries. Yeah, really sorry for that. Um, and uh, also, I mean, how the food is contaminated. There was one question, uh, if there are comparative studies and, and, and publications uh, on, on, on this pop pollution, dioxin pollution. Um, and I already included in the chat, uh, you know, our review article from Petalik et al. So that's a review on global contamination of uh, dioxin free range eggs around po pollution sources. So it has open access. And also I posted our other review article, which is uh, on general livestock. So that also is uh, um, open um, uh, open source, uh, which uh, everybody uh, can, uh, can, can download and, and, and have a look at. Uh, it also includes uh, 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 solutions. And uh, so therefore for the last presentation, uh, we were thinking, yes, uh, let's say after showing all these problems, uh, we should also have at the end, uh, let's say a kind of uh, uh, so solutions. And one uh, important part of the solutions are international conventions to control plastic and related hazardous chemicals. And uh, here, um, I would like to go uh, through the follow following topics. First, why chemicals and waste conventions, then short overview on main chemical and waste conventions, the Basel Convention on Transboundary uh, Waste, the Stockholm Convention eliminating pops in plastic, the development of a global plastic treaty, and uh, the last two slides on scientists support for global uh, plastic treaty. Yes, we have seen now in the last two presentations the pollution to the marine and also the, the, the pollution to the terrestrial environment. I have introduced uh, in my first presentation uh, that the global boundaries um, have been exceeded uh, for plastic uh, and, and for chemical pollution. And uh, therefore, the problem of exceeding global boundaries and the challenge of transboundary pop pollution or the plastic release into oceans can only be solved by global approaches. Similarly, the management and control of hazardous waste, such as electronic waste or POPs waste, including POP containing plastic waste, need an environment, uh, international frame that these expensive to manage and polluting wastes are not exported and dumped in developing countries as the cheapest solution. Therefore, over the last three decades, Global and regional multilateral environmental agreements, so-called NIAs, were developed. These are agreements between countries to take global or regional actions when the world or region has an environmental problem, which can only be solved by collaboration of the countries. In this slide, you see an overview on, on global conventions uh, on chemicals and waste. I uh, highlight here, let's say, just those which are really uh, relevant uh, to, to plastic. So this is the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste and Their Disposal, the Stockholm Convention on Elimination of POPs for the Protection of Human Health and the Environment, and since 2022, uh, an so-called an plastic treaty, an international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution is under development. Also, there are um, regional uh, conventions and um, like Barcelona Convention or Helcon Convention, OSPA Convention, mainly related to, to ocean pollution. Here, I only want to highlight the Barcelona Convention on the protection of the marine environment and the coastal region of the Mediterranean. So this, is, this convention is also one of the oldest one from 1976. And it is the first regional regulatory framework for marine litter. So therefore, I would recommend you uh, from other regions to, uh, to have a look to the Barcelona Convention and what they are doing in respect to um, 
regulatory frame, regional regulatory frame uh, from um, Marine Little. Um, coming to the Basel Convention of the control of transboundary movement of hazardous waste and their disposal, so uh, adapted in 1998 and effective uh, since uh, 1992, uh, we have uh, 187 parties. This means uh, nearly whole Asia, whole Africa, South America uh, is party. So we have only a few countries here in Africa and United States. Uh, only eight UN countries are not parties. Yeah, And only, I think, the United States from the industrial countries is not party. So the Basel Convention, um, the main reason was the concern about dumping hazardous waste in developing countries. So here, the title environmental regulation in industrial countries since the 1970s and 1980s and the increase in waste fees in industrial countries resulted in increased export of hazardous waste from industrial countries to developing countries. These were the so-called toxic traders. So they were and are searching for cheaper solutions, shipping hazardous waste to Africa, Asia, or East Europe. So that were especially highlighted by some high profile chemical accidents in the 1970s, like the Seviso waste, also waste export from the United States, which was documented here by uh, Annie Leonard. And I would uh, recommend everybody to have a look to this um, mo movie, uh, the, the, the Story of Stuff, or read her book, uh, the, the, the Story of Stuff. Um, so she was following for 15 years uh, the, the toxic waste export. Uh, from the United States. So the key objectives of the Basel Convention and the goal of the convention is to protect human health and the environment from the adverse effect, which result from inappropriate management of hazardous and other waste. It has a control of transboundary movement of hazardous waste and their disposal, which is the key objective. So here, the convention is based on two pillars. We have uh, the control regime for the transboundary movement of hazardous waste. This is applying the prior informed consent. Uh, this means uh, shipments made without consent of the other countries where the waste is shipped to, which is, is illegal, Article 6 of the Convention. Also, uh, this control regime asked each party, I mean 187 countries, um, and required to introduce appropriate national or domestic legislation to prevent and punish illegal traffic in hazardous and other waste. And then um, the Basel Convention is promoting the environmental sound management of hazardous waste. And this includes the, the treatment um, and disposal of hazardous waste as close as possible to their original source the reduction of transboundary movement of hazardous waste and other waste to a minimum uh, uh, consistent with their environmentally sound management and the minimization of the generation of hazardous waste uh, at all. So, um, in a moment, Suck. Basel Convention has uh, partly hard law. So here the, it, uh, the Basel Convention defined certain uh, waste which uh, are, is subjected uh, to control. Uh, this is in Article 1. One. Hazardous waste uh, are listed uh, according to Annexes 1, 3, and 8. So when you go into the uh, Basel Convention text, uh, you can go to the Annexes and see what is listed there. Um, then it also uh, has a list of other waste. This is Annex 2, waste for specific considerations. And so this now includes also certain plastic waste since 2019. I will come to the more detail. Uh, other waste, the main list of hazardous waste uh, of the Basel Convention includes here persistent organic pollutant waste, but also biomedical and health care waste, used oils, mining waste, industrial waste, different type of end-of-life equipment, including lead-acid batteries, PCBs, e-waste, uh, ships, waste, uh, end-of-life ships, uh, designed for dismantling and asbestos, and like I said, the mixed plastic since 2019. The Basel Convention does not control ozone depleting substances because that falls under Montreal Protocol, and also not radioactive waste. This is managed by the International Agency of uh, um, 
Then, um, what were the driver for the Basel Convention for listing um, plastic uh, in 2019? So when you look to the plastic trade before 2018, yeah, things look halfway clean because major plastic waste export from the G7 uh, countries and other industrial countries went mainly to China. Um, and China was, uh, let's say, managing a, a big part of the waste. Um, additionally, some plastic export to, uh, went to other countries, uh, but that was really a smaller amount here to Malaysia, India, or Vietnam. So some of these imported waste was recycled, um, but a large share of the imported waste was disposed or openly burned. And in 2017, uh, there was the film Plastic China, uh, which shows the, the problem also of China, also, let's say, having somehow uh, waste management capacity, what kind of pollution result from this import of plastic waste. So therefore, um, China banned imports of plastic scrap in 2018 to protect their environment. It was called Operation National Sword, and they only allowed the import of plastic if the purity is more than 99.5% for recycling. And by this, um, by this move, this created really global plastic waste trade chaos. So China was really um, successful. So you see how the import to China has been uh, reduced here from 1,000, from more than a, a million ton uh, to to uh, around uh, 100,000 tons, yeah. But what has happened is that this plastic went then to other countries: Malaysia, Vietnam, India, Thailand, Indonesia, um, other Asian countries. And this is what just Yu Yun showed. Yeah, I, after China banned the waste, moved to South East uh, Asia, and uh, luckily, at least there were NGO watchdogs which documented these waste crises and made an outcry, showed the, the pollution here um, in, in the Philippines, in Malaysia, in Indonesia. And uh, this was a main driver that then in 2019, uh, the Basel Convention were considering listing of plastic. Yeah? Norway uh, did the proposal. So in May 2019, in the fourth conference of parties, the Basel Convention adopted here the decision. So they adopted the amendments into the annex and brought uh, plastic waste, mixed plastic waste uh, into the annex as a waste which need to be managed under the Basel Convention and which cannot be exported to developing countries. So therefore, from 2021 on, 186 states and one regional economic integration organization, that's uh, uh, Europe, <laughs> around the world are bound by the amendments. So there is an exemption. So four plastic waste types are exempted from this control, and this include plastic waste almost exclusively containing non-halogenated polymers, um, PE, PP, and PET. So the Basel Convention does not uh, prevent uh, recycling. So if, uh, let's say, clean plastic waste is moving from industrial countries to developing countries, that's possible, but it needs to be um, uh, clean. Yeah. There's only, there are also for, for some other plastics, it, it's the same. So if it's really for recycling and, and, and clean, it is allowed to be uh, exported and imported. Um, and there is one exemption mixture of polyethylene and polypropylene and, 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 and PET uh, mixture. If this mixture is clean, it is also uh, possible to export. Yeah. So on one hand, yes, that's good because we do not uh, want to prohibit recycling by the Basel Convention. On the other hand, of course, it's not uh, easy to control, especially in developing countries. Um, the Basel Convention has uh, other approaches to support uh, then this kind of management. So the Basel Convention within the Basel Convention, uh, technical guidelines are developed. This include. Uh, for example, technical guidelines for environmental sound management of POPs or PCB waste. And now recently, a detailed technical guidelines on the environmental sound management of plastic waste has been um, developed and published. So you can go 
to the conference of party meeting and can download this uh, as an inf document. New version from March 2023. There are then also partnership programs on plastics or, for example, on computers and uh, the establishment of regional centers, which are supporting in the region uh, on, on hazardous waste management and for plastic uh, in 2000, um, in 2020, um, plastic waste partnership has been developed. Um, different funding uh, countries like uh, Norway, also from Germany, money has been uh, uh, given to the Basel uh, Convention Secretariat and 23 pilot projects have been implemented by, by governments 2021 to 2023, and uh, certainly they will uh, continue. Only a few slides on the Stockholm Convention, also to show that the Stockholm Convention here, which has uh, 186 uh, parties around the world, can promote, um, let's say, the control of pop containing plastic waste. Like I said, we have now a range of additives um, which uh, can, uh, let's say, um, help that the Stockholm Convention can move at least some uh, plastic waste management globally. Here, the Stockholm Convention have uh, different approaches and activities. One is eliminating or restricting the production use, import and export of pops. So those plastic additives which are listed are either restricted um, or if there is an exemption uh, kind of controlled and uh, normally after five years also this uh, uh, specific exemption will stop. Then it's promoting best available technology, best environmental practice to reduce pop emission, eliminate pop stockpiles and waste, including now plastic containing pops. Procedure for adding new pops. So the, you have seen that we have now three other pop uh, candidates, um, which are plastic additives, and probably more will come. And the Stockholm Convention, very important, has a mechanism for financial and technical assistance. And therefore, the Global Enabling Facility, which is a part of the World Bank, where also industrial countries are uh, donating money and developing countries can ask for projects, have now already projects under the Stockholm Convention on Global Phase-Out and Management of Pop Plastic Additives, um, which are financed by this mechanism. So here uh, we have uh, two projects on HBCD uh, phase-out uh, in China and in Turkey. So this project stopped the last eight hexapromocyclodecan production plants in China. So they stopped within, the pro in, within that project uh, in, in November 2021. Uh, the projects uh, do an assessment and substitution with better alternative flame retardants. Uh, here, the Chinese Environmental Ministry has an activity to make capacity building in the ministry on alternative assessment. Then it has components on eliminating uh, stockpiles and waste, both projects in China and Turkey. And this project then will have a global uh, knowledge platform. This means that other countries can learn from this project. Then we have management projects of PBDE containing uh, plastic waste in Indonesia, Ivory Coast, and Nigeria. So here there is capacity building on monitoring and separation of PBDE containing plastic waste from e-waste. Uh, and also uh, in Ivory Coast, it's also end-of-life vehicles, uh, improved management of PBDE containing waste. And um, therefore, let's say these projects can be seen as pilot projects, which might be replicated in other countries and can be uh, replicated also for other POPs plastic additives, yeah, and possibly also for other additives of concern, but probably this will be in another frame, uh, which I will shortly introduce. So here the Stockholm Convention also have uh, best available technology, best environmental practice guidances here for the PBDEs and one guidance for HBCD, for the PBDEs, for the first development. I was also lead author. I like that guidance because it's quite practical and really have a compilation of different separation technology for PBDE containing uh, plastic, which also can be used, let's say, for some other pollutants. It compiles the destruction technologies for pop containing brominated plastic waste and links to the Basel Convention technical guidelines. The last part is here now on the UN process for a global plastic treaty. So here the United Nations Environmental Assembly in 2022 adopted a resolution and plastic pollution towards an internationally legal binding instruments. So here 
the executive director uh, requests an intergovernmental uh, negotiation committee to be developed. So this happened in the second half of 2022 with the ambition of completing its work by the end of 2024. So this means that by end of 2024, we hopefully have a, a plastic treaty, might be a, a convention or another frame. And uh, there is a decision um, to develop this international legally binding instrument. Uh, and this instrument should be based on a comprehensive approach that addresses the full life cycle of uh, plastic. So uh, the first um, meeting of the International Governmental Negotiation Committee we had in uh, 2022. At the moment, uh, the, the second meeting, INC2, is prepared, which will take place uh, 29th May to the 2nd June um, in uh, uh, Paris at the a UNESCO headquarter. And uh, this will have as one uh, important topic, uh, the progress on the spotlight on circular economy. Yeah, so therefore you see also our workshop, uh, our webinar comes uh, quite, uh, quite timely. Um, from this process, only two recommendations of, of, of two documents uh, maybe to have a look at. Um, one is the document from UNEP on potential options for elements of the Global Plastic Treaty. So that's a working document here. Um, potential options for elements towards an international legally binding instrument based on a comprehensive approach that addresses the full life cycle of plastics. Yeah, you can download for free. And I have a recommendation of a second document. Uh, this is a survey of state submissions on substantive elements. This means objectives, core obligations, control measures, and voluntary approaches and implementation elements uh, from the Guardini Center 2023, I think just from last month. So they have compiled because UNEP made a survey of uh, from stakeholders, what is their opinion on the convention. And so many uh, countries have submitted their idea what elements should be included, but also other stakeholders, industry, NGOs have submitted. So you can download all these uh, kind of answers from the different stakeholders uh, if you are interested and if you have time. The last two slides. Um, also, you know, I'm, yes, on one hand, I'm consultant, but on the other hand, uh, yes, I'm also a scientist. Um, and the scientists have uh, formed a scientists coalition uh, for an effective plastic treaty, which uh, springs out of the scientists declaration prepared for UNIA 5.2 yeah, in, in February 2022. So I recommend you uh, to have a look at it, to this declaration. You still can, uh, uh, ready, um, can sign uh, this convention. And also I include here the contact to the scientists uh, coalition, which is supported uh, from the Norwegian uh, government where you also have a, a kind of sec secretariat. And um, the other um, science uh, NGO which is working and which has been introduced is International Panel on Chemical Pollution. Yes, one with uh, the publication which we supported the last three years and the current project where you had this webinar and we are at the moment doing this, uh, this monitoring of, of POPs in plastic. Um, so you see the research community is, uh, is active, but uh, yes, we need uh, more support. Also the scientists coalition said, uh, scientists interested uh, can uh, not only um, ratify the, the declaration, but also can become a member and uh, the same uh, for IPCP. Yeah, thank you for your attention. We have a few more questions. Yeah, Lisa. Hello. Okay, so Dr. Weber, I will start with one question for you. Um, so one of the technologies included in the um, Basel Convention guidelines for POPs elimination is the metal production furnaces use approved by uh, PBDE. Do you consider that we should ask to withdraw this technology from the guidelines as a separation of plastics before processing metal scraps is the BP, uh, BEP? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, first, uh, you know, 
uh, metal metal industry in this mean metal smelters are normally not made for incineration yeah so you need really good state of art um metal uh smelters which have a post combustion that you can let's say also include plastic yeah i mean there is there are two reasons why yeah i mean you can manage some plastic in in, in shut smelters i mean the first one is that you cannot uh, separate anyway 100 percent of the plastic from the metals and uh, the second that you anyway need energy in these smelters but i would say that you need a post combustion if you don't have post combustion and not so many smelters in the world have really good uh, post combustion facilities uh, you should not use a smelter for these um for, for for the management of plastic yeah and also you know the plastic is, is so huge yeah but uh some of the smelters might have some capability uh to manage some of the plastics uh but also i would like to see more studies on this yeah i mean i have looked into these studies and uh you know there are not so so many hard uh fact uh data and and, and measurements yeah so i think if they want to do more, then there should be more measurements. Thank you. And we just have another question. Um, what's the function of PCBs and sealants? Ah, no, they are they are plasticizers. Yeah. So they are they are uh, super plasticizers, or they were super plasticizers. Yeah. I mean, up to in the sealants, you have between uh, five and and twenty five percent of 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 PCBs, and um, you see that because yes you have seen that only 0 0.06 percent of the pcbs get out of the sealants so therefore also after 60 years the sealants are are still functional yeah so this plasticizing is the function here uh, of pcbs thank you and we have a couple of questions for professor takada so uh, one of the questions involves the analytical methods. So what challenges come when we analyze BUVs in plastic samples and how can those challenges be tackled? Mm, yeah, the one of the challenge is the pattern of the occurrence in plastics. The occurrence of bulbs, the additives are very much sporadic. So we have to analyze the plastic piece by piece to find the high concentration of the additive in the plastics. For example, the, our students analyze the pellets from the beach one by one. So she analyzed totally 25 pieces of pellets and among the 25, 24 pellets had no additives. Only one pellet had very much high concentration of additives. So that's a kind of challenge. So how, how to, to solve such kind of heterogeneous distribution of pops and additives in plastic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Takada. And in our uh, next webinar um, in the second half of May, uh, we will have one um, uh, webinar just about screening and sampling of plastic. And in this webinar, we will also address this kind of complexity because this we do not have only in, in pellets, uh, this problem. We also have it in electronic waste plastics, you know, oh, that is very heterogeneous. And yeah. uh, also for this sampling and 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 let's say make an uh, <laughs> a, a, a real uh, to to understand what is the average uh, concentration yeah these kind of uh, considerations about the heterogeneity uh, is 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 crucial so we will address this in the second uh, webinar yeah the, in the second half of May heterogeneity the makes our a variation of bioaccumulation of the additives from plastic is very much difficult. Thank you. Yeah. We have one and more question. For, for UV, for the UVs, we do not have uh, many monitoring studies now. Yeah. yeah I mean, yes, right. you, you are looking now in the pellets and, and you, you see, yes, polypropylene sometimes have high levels. 
um, we know, of course, from the pop reviewing committee, but there are not really detailed studies about uh, UV in different products uh, and in, 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 in what uh, plastic uh, we will practically find the UV 3 to 8. Yeah. yeah. Okay, one more question. So, uh, okay. Professor Takada, what are the yeah. most concerning toxicity pathways of benzotriacyls, and um, are these AHR receptor ligands of endocrine disrupting chemicals? So, regarding the UB three to eight, the binding affinity with the female hormone receptor is not so high. And they can act as the they can bind with AHR receptor. That's my understanding. So they they, they can act as something like dioxin like toxicity. Great. Because Thank of you. their planar structure. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Lisa, have, you have, do you have other questions? We have one more question for Professor Takada. So taking into account these results you have shown, do you think that low pop content of UV328 um, of Declarine Plus should be similar to the B, uh, PBDE or even lower? Yeah. That is the one milligram per kilogram. No, so, one thousand one thousand milligram per kilogram is is the is the low pop content uh, uh, for PPDEs. One one thousand one thousand milligram per kilogram. Yeah, uh, and then there is a second Basel so provisional. High. Huh? It's so high for UV three to eight. For UV three to eight, the one one milligram per kilogram could be the some kind of guideline. Okay, so that's that's quite low. Yeah, so we will see what will happen. Yeah, uh, when UV three to eight will be listed, because normally uh, we were not going uh, to that low levels only for the dioxins. Yeah, uh, and mm -hmm. for PCNs we have uh, ten milligram uh, uh, per per kilogram. For PCBs we have fifty. Yeah, so we will see what will come out for UV three to eight and for Declorin Plus. It, it's in the plastics. Uh, it's in the bio. -water. No, 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 no. It is about plastic. You know, low pop content is always about waste. This means yes, uh, yes. low pop content will be set for plastic waste, yeah, uh, or for other wastes, yeah. And then uh, there, the the proposal for I mean, PBDE has one thousand. Uh, milligram per kilogram and 50 milligram per kilogram. There's still a discussion between different stakeholders. And uh, so there will be then also a working group uh, in the Basel Convention, which will uh, discuss on low pop content uh, for for UV 3 to 8 in waste and for Declorin Plus. Yeah, and we will see what, what comes out. Yeah, there will be a working group. Yeah, even blended working waste, group. Wasted plastics or Plastic resin pellet. We no, no. It it is about plastic yeah, waste. It's Basel Convention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the plastic waste, we didn't see such high concentration of UV three to eight. Mm -hmm. If the we set such high concentration for guideline, it's it's not so effective to regulate UV three to eight by the law. Okay. So yeah. higher, much lower guideline should be set. Okay. So practical that that that's something uh, that it would give an Im impact. Yeah. yeah. Of course, okay. it depends on the lowest level of those lowest toxicity level. Yes. Yes. But of course, it should also be related to toxicity. Yes. I mean, that's also one reason. Why, yes, PCB has 50 uh, milligram per, 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 per kilogram. Some countries, I mean, in in Japan, I think you, you have uh, less than one uh, milligram per kilogram for PCBs, yeah. So um, also, yes, some considerations, but often, unfortunately, most low pop content 
are not really considering uh, toxicity when when it's developed. Yeah, it's rather often a practical uh, uh, consideration. Tomorrow in my presentation about PBD, I will have the topic of low pop content and uh, also on some implication in respect to recycling. That will be tomorrow. Other question, Lisa? That seems to be all for today. Okay, no, super. Yeah, thanks very much. Then I have only a last slide and this is for tomorrow. Um, yes, tomorrow we will also have a, a webinar again uh, from 12 to 4 o'clock uh, um, European time. Um, so here, this time we will introduce to the different um, pop groups. Yeah, we will have one presentation introduction to brominated pops, uh, one on um, um, the short chain and medium chain chlorinated paraffins. Um, then uh, introduction to the pop candidate Declorant Lass, and also introduction to the pop candidate uh, UV328 and uh, introduction to fluorinated pops and related uh, polymers and plastics. Uh, in, and in addition, we will have uh, two practical studies on monitoring pops uh, here, PBDEs in new products, including toys and also um, chlorinated paraffins in, in plastic products. From National Institute of Environmental Science. So, yes, yeah, thank you uh, to everybody. Yeah, also to go a little bit over time uh, today. Sorry for that, but the topic is broad. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I mean, people were interested, had good questions. Thank you all for the questions and hope uh, to see all of you uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much for the presenters. Yeah, Professor Takada Shige um, to develop uh, this super presentation and also Yu Yun. Uh, also, thanks very much uh, to you uh, for developing uh, such an impressive uh, presentation and show the challenges uh, of, of, of your region. Yeah, And to all of you, a good day to Professor Takada. He has now uh, closed, is close to midnight in Japan. Yeah, Professor Takada, now you can go <laughs> home and uh, yes, and, and, and catch a bit of sleep uh, and hope to see you Hello. all. Yes. Of course, no, I have to escape from university before the gate is closed. It's close to midnight. Yes, you have you have um, a bit more than half an hour to get out of the university. Otherwise, you, you might need your bed in your in your laboratory. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good. So, see you see, see you all uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Have a good day. Yeah. You too. Roland, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor yeah. Takeda. Bye bye. And thanks Thank much uh, to Lisa. Yeah, that was also oh, super yeah. to manage the question. You, that was a big help. Yeah, really. Yeah, thanks very much um, for Fun taking care. Yeah. yeah, good team. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, bye bye. So much. I enjoyed all the talks. Super. Yeah, me too. Yeah.